uh yeah we're samantha would you please turn on my uh magical powers tony thank you thank you let's fix this right now there we go all righty well good evening everybody i know i'm not supposed to call names but sometimes i just get so excited to see different people in different classes hi miss james it's been a minute <laughs> haven't seen you oh, whoa uh -uh. we don't need to do that jesus i don't know why y'all would throw me off like that in the middle of me talking <laughs> oh my gosh this is not good All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, my team just threw me off completely. I, I don't even know where I was, but it, it was good to see um, a couple of your faces uh, that I hadn't seen in a while. And um, it's always good to have all of you here with us at MPU University. My name is Leah LaRue, for those that don't know me, and I'm from the Department of City Planning at the City of Atlanta. I'm joined tonight by my amazing team, and I will take a brief moment to introduce them if you don't mind. Samantha Terry is our Program Manager for Training and Education and our MPU University Registrar. Hey, everybody. And Tony McNeil is our Program Manager for Outreach and Engagement. Good evening, everyone. I believe Daniel is here. I saw Daniel, who is our um, resources and support manager. Hi. <laughs> all right, and me. Um, so really, really glad to have you all here at MPU University. This is our um, uh, community leadership track. This is 1003.002, which is the second of four parliamentary procedures courses that we offer. Tonight's class is on managing discussion around hot topics to conduct efficient meetings. I think uh, any of you who have attended MPU meetings and even neighborhood association meetings have been in those meetings that run really long because the topic is one that everyone is interested in. So we're gonna give you some uh, tonight, some, some tools and some tips and some ideas for how you can manage discussion without um, stifling or silencing voices uh, from the folks that make up your MPU or your neighborhood association. Really, really happy to have with us, uh, those of you who've been here before, you are, uh, he's no stranger to you. Dennis Conway is our, um, is a registered parliamentarian at Conway Parliamentary Services, and he teaches all four of our parliamentary procedures courses. He is very uh, familiar with the MPU system. Every once in a while, there will be questions that come up that he will um, um, swing over to me. Unfortunately, tonight I've got an MPU meeting, so I won't be here for the duration of the course, but while I'm here, if there's any questions that I can answer, we will. Otherwise, we'll jot them down and get answers for you uh, at another time. All right, so I think we're going to our classroom rules. At, uh, we ask that everyone please keep your microphone muted. Of course, that cuts down on um, background noise and feedback. I think by now we've all experienced that feedback and that background noise that you get when someone's microphone gets unmuted, whether by mistake or not. Um, please use reactions. If you want to clap or give a thumbs up or something, feel free to use reactions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment during Q&A, please raise your hand to get in the queue. We ask that you please do not unmute yourself and just start talking. Please raise your hand um, to get in the queue, and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Before we do, our most important rule, all questions must be relevant to course content. I say that because uh, we obviously, this, this program is sponsored by the city of Atlanta. And as such, sometimes we attract people who have an interest in 
venting about one thing or another or raising issues that are kind of not within our um, frame of influence more importantly are not relevant to the topic of the course and then other people start to get uncomfortable or annoyed and then we get emails asking why we didn't stop that person from saying all that they said and asking all that they asked to avoid all of that we ask that you please make sure that your questions are relevant to course content to raise your hand you can click on the reactions button at the bottom select reactions and then you'll see a little pop-up box and at the bottom of that pop-up box there is a button that says raise hand that is how you raise your hand and um, i think without further ado we may as well go ahead and get started mr conway the floor is yours thank you so much leah and thank you for having me uh back again this evening uh, to teach on parliamentary procedure uh, i always enjoy it i i always enjoy the questions the interaction uh, a lot of a lot of um, interested and smart people that get involved in these classes, and so it's always a joy for me. And I thank I appreciate you, Leah and Elizabeth and uh, Samantha and and Tony and Daniel and the team and everybody that works hard to 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 um, serve the city of Atlanta on your end and your responsibilities, but also for for putting together these classes and helping us to look at these very important subjects as you try to work in your local NPU in the city of Atlanta. This training tonight, as has been pointed out, is parliamentary procedure. It's managing discussions around hot topics uh, to conduct a fit. This is going to be a little bit different. If you've been in any of my training courses before, uh, you're going to see that it's going to be a little bit different, maybe a lot different than what you're used to. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we're not going to be talking about a lot of procedural rules and a lot, of, a lot of steps to take and so on. Uh, we can do that a little bit toward the end. There's gonna be a little bit of that. We can do that a little bit toward the end if you have those kind of questions, if we have time. But primarily what it's gonna to be tonight is it's going to be the principles that we find in Robert's Rules of or Order that, and, and in other parliamentary uh, rule books as well, by the way, that, that talk about principle and talk about how to deal with, with um, with, with difficult topics, with controversial topics, with something that everybody's interested in. There's a lot of, a lot of various opinions. Sometimes those can be um, discouraging. Those kinds of meetings can be discouraging. You find yourself thinking, well, this was awful. We're supposed to be able to come together and we're supposed to be able to, uh, as friends and neighbors, we're supposed to be able to work through these things and, and be kind and respectful and, and then uh, come to a decision. Um, sometimes it doesn't work that way. But believe it or not, Robert's Rules of Order has, has principles laid out in the book to help, to help work toward that end. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. Again, it's not going to be a lot of uh, details about procedure, but rather principles to implement um, for, for, uh, for, for meetings in order to keep them comfortable and, uh, and, and productive. So, and, and, and I want to, and it's gonna, not going to sound like this is a parliamentary procedure uh, session tonight in some senses, but I want to assure you that everything that we're providing is coming right out of Robert's Rules of Order, uh, newly revised. As a matter of fact, it's the 12th edition. So I believe everyone was sent a worksheet. Uh, I think that's right, and uh, I have a copy in front of me. And so if you do have a copy of your worksheet, we'll walk through this, and we'll, we'll talk about the various points that come up. For questions, go ahead, if you think of a question, go ahead as Leah described, go ahead and type it into the chat and, and the, the leadership will monitor that. Uh, at certain points during the presentation, I'll ask for questions and, um, and we'll have a time toward the end, uh, I would expect we'll have time toward the end to ask questions and deal with, uh, deal with things that, that maybe you didn't get to during the, during the class. So we'll go ahead and get right, right to it again. And, and keep in mind what we're doing is we're talking about the question of how to deal with a controversial, and this, this is the words that I'm using tonight, how to deal with a controversial subject or how to deal with a difficult subject in your business meeting, and specifically as an NPU. First of all, as, as we pointed out in the notes, as we pointed out in the notes, um, the, the NPU or the, or the 
the, the members and the leadership, they need to value procedure. They need to put a high value in, in parliamentary procedure. And, and the reason is because that's exactly what parliamentary procedure was designed for. It was designed to, to keep meetings organized. And so to, to just say, well, you know, we're all friends here. We don't really need that. Um, I see that happen in some places. And, uh, and then when the difficult subjects come up, um, it turns out to be more difficult than it should be. So we all have opinions, as I got in your notes, and I know that's pretty academic, that's, that's pretty basic, um, but, but we're supposed to have opinions. We're supposed to have uh, opinions that really get us stirred up. That's, that's, that's part of um, being involved in an organization, that's part of being involved uh, in, in the community. Uh, it's good and desirable to have opinions. It's good and desirable to have strong opinions. So I, I provided a quote from Robert Tools of Order. This is uh, uh, the, the 43rd section, paragraph 21. And it says this, when a question is pending, a member can condemn the nature or likely consequences of the proposed measure in strong terms. Now that's, that's important to recognize. Because oftentimes when we're, when we're in a meeting and we're involved in debate, and by the way, the uh, Robert's Rules of Order and other parliamentary rule books, they use the word debate, and it's not a negative term. Debate is, in, in procedural matters, debate is an idea where you have an opinion, I have opinion, a number of folks are sharing those opinions. And, and along with that, we may not agree. As a matter of fact, the term debate implies that we don't agree but yet we all get to share our opinions. And so uh, don't, don't, be, don't be surprised, don't be shocked uh, when, when uh, we use the term debate, when somebody disagrees with us. This point that I just quoted, I want you to, I want you to take special note. This comes right out of Robert Schultz's order. In other words, it is saying, and I wanna repeat it because I want this to be clear, when a question is pending, a member, a member can condemn the nature, condemn the nature or likely consequences of the proposed measure in strong terms. So don't feel bad about doing it. And don't think when somebody is, is very passionate about their point, let's suppose somebody just spoke on an idea. Let's, let's use the idea of a liquor license for a local organization. Let's say somebody just spoke on the, on the, on the, um, the affirmative side of granting a liquor license to a local, a local organization. You disagree. Go ahead and disagree. Go ahead and, go ahead and feel um, comfortable disagreeing. And, and matter of fact, go ahead and disagree in very strong terms. There's nothing wrong with that. You feel strongly that this organization shouldn't have a liquor license. Well, let it be known in the strongest terms that you, that, that, that would truly and effectively express your position. So, so that, is, that is really important. Don't get sidetracked and don't, don't, don't misinterpret that kind of, a, that kind of a, a, a posture in debate. Strong opinions is what moves an organization forward. If everybody just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, it really doesn't matter, your organization probably isn't gonna get much done. So, so strong opinions are a good thing. It's not. Is Dennis frozen or is it me? Sorry. Sorry, it may have been me. Carry on. No, no, I think he's frozen. Okay, Dennis? Yes? Okay, you're back. You, it, it, your signal was weak and it went out for a second. You're good now, oh. I think. Okay, somebody said Dennis is frozen. <laughs> you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of warm in here, so that, that's, a, that's a contradiction for me. So I'm just teasing, but, but let me go ahead and, and, and say what I said again, because I think it's pretty important. When somebody is, is passionate about an idea, again, I use the example of liquor license, you're against somebody or you're for somebody having a liquor license and somebody is, has a different view in the room in the meeting, 
Um, go ahead and be passionate about it. Go ahead and, and speak about it in strong terms. And, and so for, for those of you who are looking on or for the person who just spoke, and now so-and-so is step, standing up and they're gonna strongly disagree with what I just said, don't interpret that as being a troublemaker. Don't interpret that as being rude. Don't interpret that as being, as, as being somebody that, well, we used to be friends, what's wrong now? That's, that's not what's happening. In, in, a, in a debate, and again, as I pointed out, in Robert Schulz of Order and other parliamentary rule books, debate is a proper term. It's not a negative term. It's okay and it's right to disagree with somebody and, and feel pretty strongly about it in, in, in our discussions in a business meeting. Okay, so um, that's what keeps that's what keeps the organization moving forward. If there was no if there was no uh, strong opinions, then your organization would just lay flat. So that's that's important to remember. Like I said, this is different tonight. This isn't this isn't talking about a lot of procedural steps. This is talking about principles that underlie parliamentary procedures, so that when the difficult times come up, um, we can handle them well. That's what this is. Deliberations need to be organized. When we have strong opinions, it means that we tend to push. We're human. That's what humans do. We 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 are proud of our ideas. We're convinced about our opinions. We're convinced about about how we feel, we know we're right. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's why we compare notes, that's why we debate, because it very well may be as strong as I feel about this, and I sit down and somebody else stands up and they disagree with me, if I pay attention to what they're saying, they may bring up something, even though they're passionate, even though they're feeling in, in, in the strongest terms, they're disagreeing with what I just said. If I look past that and I pay attention to the words, they may point out something I didn't realize before. They may have information for me that I hadn't that I hadn't come across, and so um, let people feel strongly about their point, and and when you're speaking on your point, um, recognize that that you are going to be tempted to push. You're going to be tempted to to really try to drive that thing home. So so with that in mind, however, sometimes we can push too hard. Sometimes we can get carried away and we can make a mistake. Robert's Rules of Order, Parliamentary Procedure, does two things. It allows us to be passionate about our opinions, but then it, it lays boundaries down that we should not cross as we are passionate and we express those opinions. So that's what Robert's Rules of Order does both of those things. So it's important to, re, to, to remember that. The, the lines that come into play are the most difficult thing to, to work with because when you're when you've got fire in your belly and you want to go ahead and you want to convince everybody to, about what how you feel, um, keep in mind that's why that's why I entitled this section. We must value parliamentary procedure because parliamentary procedure is going to help us be organized and help everybody be heard in a passionate way, but it's going to help everybody be heard. You may be tempted to insult or accuse those who disagree with you. If you do that, you cross the line. So parliamentary procedure speaks to that. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about tonight is going to uh, be looking at that, that big bold line that, that, um, that, that, we have, that, that, that we have to deal with. I, I wanna explain something to you real quickly. This is just, this is just uh, with this class. As I'm lecturing, I have chats that are coming up and I can't help it. I find myself pausing to try to read that chat. And so if, if I'm in the middle of what I'm saying and I pause for a second and I'm looking at the screen, that's what's going on. So I'm gonna do my best just for, for all of you who know, I'm gonna do my best to ignore those chats. And then we'll, if there's a question in there that, can, that we can address um, when it's time, then, then, I'll, then I'll do that. So, so those of you who are, doing the chats if you're here seeing me pause um, i'm gonna i'm gonna try to ignore them i'm not ignoring you we're just gonna try to look at it at an appropriate time parliamentary procedure keeps this energy under control the strong opinions that we have are right the proper they're good and it's good and it's proper to express those strong opinions in robert's rules of order as it says in strong terms so this is a this is the same sentence but there's more to it now 
So, so this is out of Robert's Rules of Order, 12th edition. It's, it's um, 4321. When a question is pending, a member can condemn the nature or, or likely consequences of the proposed measure in strong terms, but he must avoid personalities and under no circumstances can he attack or question the motives of another member. You may experience a correction by the chair or another member because you've gotten carried away. That is appropriate and that's proper. If you, if somebody just disagreed with you, somebody said something that you disagreed with and you stand up and you catch yourself going, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about or that, that wasn't true or, or something like that. Um, you may get corrected. As a matter of fact, in those, with those two examples, you should get corrected. So, so that's what parliamentary procedure is about in a, in a large way. Now, remember what we're talking about tonight. And I want to keep going back to this because it's going to sound like to be honest with you, if, if you didn't know any better, it's going to sound like I'm getting a little preachy tonight. That's really not what's happening. Everything that I'm talking about is right out of Robert's Rules of Order. It's out of Mason's Manual. It's out of uh, the Standard Code for Parliamentary Procedure, or AIP, uh, American Institute for Parliamentarians. So, so these are common concerns and common lessons that come out of parliamentary rule books, especially the most, the most well used. Your ideas must be good about, uh, must be about what's good for the organization. Let me repeat that. Remember, your ideas must be about what is good for the organization. So I've got a couple other quotes now from Robert Rules of Order. The basic principles of decision and deliberative assembly is that to become the act or choice of the body, a proposition must be adopted by a majority vote. That is direct approval implying assumption of responsibility for the act must be registered by more than a half of the members present in voting on a particular matter in regular or properly called meeting of the body. Now I provided that whole quote, but the main point there is to recognize that, that it is the majority of the membership that decides what's gonna happen in your organization. That's who you're talking to. That's who you're trying to convince. And by the way, let me just say, this is who this is who um, who you need to be helping. If your point, if if the thing that you're passionate about is best for the majority, then then that means a lot, and that should be a goal of yours as you speak to the question that's at hand. Simply being able to get your way doesn't help the organization. It's not about that. Always remember the the, the point must be agreeable to the majority. The majority of the membership. That's that's, and I don't want to, I don't want to sound. Um, the, I'll put it this way: this is the majority of the membership who who's going to have the final say. So as you speak, if you in your approach start making everybody upset at you, if you're right, you've kind of lost the point. So keep that in mind. Remember, we're talking about difficult discussions, controversial discussions. You feel strongly about it. You stand up and you start going and then you start saying things and maybe the chair doesn't call you on it. Maybe others don't call you on it. And maybe they should and they don't. And you just, you're allowed to continue and you start alienating the room. Well, most of the people you just alienated are gonna be voting in a minute. And when they go to vote, they don't like the way you handled that and they may just vote against you because you were uh, inappropriate. So remember that it's about the majority of the voting members in the room. That's who you're talking to. And so it doesn't mean you can't disagree with them, but it does mean that you need to show them the due respect that, that, that is theirs. If the will of the majority is consistently reflected, the chances of personal and organizational success are greatly enhanced. To pursue your wishes over the majority is a failed endeavor. And I'm not trying to be unkind. Uh, I'm trying to be helpful to every speaker, to every person that's gonna stand up and speak in your NPU. I'm trying to be helpful to you and I'm, and I'm not trying to be coarse or unkind. But to keep perspective, understand that that it, it's, and you've heard this is almost a cliche, but per, permit me to use it again. It's not about you. 
the, the, the discussion at hand isn't about you getting your way. It is about you proving your point. It is about you stating your ideas in the most rational and convincing way possible. But keep these things in mind. It is about the majority of the folks in the room. It is an appeal to the majority of the folks in the room. And it is to respect the people in the room. Now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one more statement, then we'll, let, then we'll see if there are any questions. And again, I'm not trying to be unkind, but I, I really want to drive this home because where we find ourselves, and I've done it, I'm not, I'm not um, uh, exempt here for the, for the tendencies that come up in a difficult discussion. I have the same challenges. And so when I'm standing up in a meeting and I'm trying to convince everybody and I'm trying to, you know, if they, everybody would just do it my way, they would see that this is the best thing. And it may not come out that way or it may not come out specifically in those terms, but if I'm not careful, that's, that's what I'm actually doing if, 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 if I check myself. And so think about what the ramifications of that means. Remember what we're doing. We're involved in an NPU where the majority of the people get to vote and they're using parliamentary procedure. So that means that, that if I'm gonna ignore procedure and I'm just gonna to try to make everybody do it my way, well, forget the meeting. And again, I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm just trying to drive a point home. Forget the meeting. Let's don't have a meeting. Let's just ask Dennis what he wants to do, and we'll all do it that way. That's where we're. That's where we're taking it. If if we if we get carried away, if we go too far, as I'm feeling strongly about my point, and I'm disregarding procedure, and I'm not respecting the others, then the then the ramifications of that is I know better than you all. And and Dennis doesn't know better than you all. That's, that's a mistaken approach. It's a, it's a majority vote scenario. So, so keep those things in mind. It's good to be passionate. And, and we're done with the first page here. It's good to be passionate, but respect the rules. When you're, when you're, uh, um, call it, when, when you, when what you're, you've said and what you propose is called out of order, respect it and respect the people in the room. Those are the people you're trying to work with. Those are the people you're trying to convince. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Are there any questions? Ms. Brooks, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute. So who is in charge of keeping the meeting flowing along the procedure? And if it's not flowing along with Robert's rules, then, and I'm not the leader, what can I do, if anything? Okay, there are, there are, uh, there are two motions that are, that are effective in this, in this, uh, for this question. Uh, I'll answer your first question. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer the second part of the question in the notes because it does come up. Um, but, but it is, it is the chairperson's responsibility to, to uh, keep the, keep the meeting organized. Now it's delegated authority. And we're going to speak to that in just a moment. But when you vote in it, when you vote in a chairperson, it is very, very important. As a matter of fact, Robert Rules Water and other rule books will point this out. Uh, a, a very important question for somebody that's going to, to chair a meeting. Do you know procedure? It's important for them to be well-liked, I suppose. It's important for them to know the neighborhood, I suppose. It is important for them to know a lot of people in the room, I suppose. But if they don't know procedure, then, then they're at a severe handicap trying to run the meeting. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about how the chairperson has to be a, a professional parliamentarian. That's not that's not the point. There are basic there are basic um, um, procedures that you at least need to be aware of so that you can so that you can maneuver and navigate um, basic and common things that come up. But it is the chair's responsibility. Mr. Martin. Um, well, there's also a question I asked in the chat that doesn't relate to what you've said so far. Um, but I, I do have a question it does relate to what you said so far, so I'll ask it now. 
Um, and, and that has to do with the interplay between Robert's rules and bylaws. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that was written into our bylaws before I ever became chairman um, was that uh, a, a resident of the impacted neighborhood has the should have the first opportunity to make a motion. But I don't see anywhere in Robert's rules where the opportunity to make a motion is defined other than as being recognized as a speaker by the chair. So if a topic is on under discussion, I recognize you to speak. I interpret that as being you now have the opportunity to make a motion. And if you choose not to make a motion, if you just make a statement and then I recognize somebody else, you have foregone that opportunity. Is that a reasonable interpretation? I, I uh, that's the first time I've ever heard a rule like that. Um, so, so basically, the, the bylaws, they outrank Robert's Rules of Order. When, when an organization puts a special rule of order, and that's what it's called, when an organization puts a special rule of order into place, sometimes they'll put them in the bylaws, sometimes they'll put them in a separate booklet so there's no confusion, but they still have that kind of strength. Um, that outranks Robert's Rules of Order. So if I understood you right, Mr. Martin, what we're talking about is for the neighborhood that's, that's going to be impacted by the question at hand, they have, in other words, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a scenario, a uh, committee uh, chairperson provides a committee report and, and it's a certain community that's gonna be affected uh, if this thing is voted in by the, by the committee that, that's been described by the committee chair. And so the chairman, you, you would say, well, um, this neighborhood has, has they're gonna be impacted so anybody from that neighborhood has a chance to, to make the first motion. If I understand it right, that uh, that's what you're describing. Um, I, I, I see it as kind of, and I don't mean to be unkind toward the person in the organization as they've done the bylaws, but, but I, don't, I almost see that as um, um, not very effective, not very helpful because the organization itself is gonna make the decision. It doesn't, and one of the things I teach organizations is that sometimes you're going to get a crazy motion, or at least in, in people's minds, it's a crazy motion that hits the floor. And then there's usually a person that's going to second it for some reason, they just always do. And so there's a motion in a second, and everybody thinks, oh, goodness gracious, what are we doing this for? Well, it'll get voted down. So it's, it's, it's almost irrelevant in my thinking, Mr. Martin, it's almost irrelevant as to as to who makes the first motion but that is what's in your bylaws and it does outrank Robert's rules of order in your particular case and the way you described it sounded right to me as you were as you were applying that rule miss wilson yes thank you I, i'd like to um ask this question when it comes to the language in robert's do any of the other guides give definition to particular words? Because what equals strong terms in one person's mind might not equal strong terms in someone else's mind. I, I, I don't remember seeing any sort of glossary or anything like that. And where would it be appropriate besides the bylaws or an SOP to incorporate and elaborate on some of the things that are in Robert's Rules. I say this because Robert's Rules is so thick and so many people may be familiar with certain provisions of it, but I have seen someone who is um, particularly sophisticated and well knowledgeable in Robert's Rules hijack a meeting. And so, to try to simplify things for people, folks put certain things in the bylaws, but I'm curious to know um, how you deal with the subjectivity that's in Robert's rules at times. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good question. There's a lot there. I'll do my best. If I don't hit the target, then please forgive me and and uh, and and restate it if I if I if I don't address your question. Um, you're right, Robert's Rules of Order, there is no glossary. Uh, it does take some reading, and a lot of times uh, 
a lot of times context will help and so on. Um, I've known people to Google the word just to see for sure what it's, what it's talking about. Um, so as far as, as far as the, uh, let's see, you asked a lot, I'm trying to remember everything that you, that you posed. Oh, as far as strong terms, the, the phrase strong terms, um, you basically the bounded, what we're talking about when we're, when Robert's Rules of Order talks about strong terms, think of it in terms of, a, of boundaries. You can, you can be as, you know, I mean, you can wave your hands, you can, you can, you know, uh, furrow your eyebrow, you can, well, I tell you what, I just don't think it's a good idea at all for those people to have a liquor license, because it just, I just, I just don't like, I just don't like alcohol, I don't drink, and my parents don't drink, and my family doesn't drink, and we just don't think it's a good idea to drink, so I just don't think, see, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you feel strongly against the idea of people using alcohol, and you don't want that down the street, so people may or may not agree with you, but it's okay to to, to speak of it in strong terms. Now, if you get too carried away, even within the parameters that Robert Schroes of Water lays down, you get too carried away, people might think, you know, then you'll start seeing eyebrows raise and, and uh, well, you know, they're just overstating it. And now I don't want to hear what they have to say anymore. So you want to try to be appropriate, passionate, but appropriate. The line is when you start doing things like, well, you're just dumb. Well, that's to be called out of order or you didn't tell the truth, that's to be called out of order. Or I caught him doing something bad, that's to be called out of order. Or I don't trust what you're, that's to be called out of order. So there, there's boundaries. You can be passionate about what you're saying, but you, but you cannot speak to personality. You can't be accusatory. You can't be insulting. And so that's, that's uh, the kind of thing you want to keep in mind. And, and so another part of your question was, Robert's Rules of Order is thick. Uh, I recommend starting with, and, and I'm going to speak to this in just a few minutes, but I'll, I'll just speak to it briefly now. Um, Robert's Rules of Order in brief, it's an abridged version, and it'll, and it'll teach you the basics. So that's, that's, that's helpful. That's important. Um, let's see. There was one more thing that you said. Oh, oh, oh. Let me, let me address this. Robert's Rules of Order as a system, the only way it can be taken advantage of is if it's done wrong. Let me repeat that. Robert's Rules of Order as a system, the only way it can be taken advantage of is if it's done wrong. Everything that has to do with procedure leads to one place, the vote of the assembly. Every procedure does. Every concern, every guideline, it all leads to one place, either directly or indirectly. It all leads to one place, and that's the vote of the assembly. So, so if Robert's if the meeting is being hijacked by Robert's Rules of Order, then then what's happening is is folks don't understand procedure enough, and that hijacking is a misapplication of Robert's Rules of Order. So Thank that you. yes, you're very welcome. That is one of the things I'm going to talk about. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it comes up next. Uh, Mr. Jake, Mr. Mills. Hey, sorry. Can you, can you hear me? I apologize. I'm on a job site. Yes, I can hear. All right. Uh, my question is, uh, how does the chair deal with a individual that continues and repeatedly uh, is out of order? Uh, not necessarily just on one meeting, uh, but in multiple meetings uh, and is very consistent with it. So um, generally speaking, and it's, and it's difficult, you know, that's one of those things where you, you kind of got to um, use finesse on the spot and have experience. But generally speaking, every meeting is different. Every meeting is a new start. Every meeting is a fresh start. Let the individual um, have a chance to do it and do it right. And if that if that fails, then handle it appropriately. Handle handle it accordingly as chairperson uh, with the rules that that are that are in place for for that type of a thing. And with NPUs, it's a little more uh, delicate, but there are some procedures that that can be done. Um, without going into those details now, I'll just I'll just say um, every 
what comes to mind as I hear your question, every meeting is a new start. Let that give that person in every meeting, even though you suspect or people suspect it's going to go wrong, still give them a chance. If they're in the meeting legally, um, then give them a chance to do it right. And maybe have a talk with them afterwards and just try to help them with some of the things we're talking about tonight. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Karen Bill. Hi, I just, to be clear, you stated that bylaws outweigh a uh, parliamentary order, correct? Well, they, um, let me put it this way. Um, there's a particular, there's a particular uh, um, rule for how long you can speak in debate and how many speeches you get per, per motion, per debatable motion. Some organizations will put in their bylaws, they'll limit it. They'll say, okay, only one speech for a debatable motion. And, and then they'll say two minutes per speech. And they'll put that in their bylaws. Well, that's a lot less than what shows up in Robert's Rules of Order. But because it's in the bylaws, if, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, it outranks Robert's Rules of Order. And so you would go by what's in the bylaws. It's not that you rewrite all the procedure in your bylaws, that's not the point, but you will have specific areas where you want to finesse or, or alter the rules to best fit your needs, the needs of your organization. And that would outweigh what, what Robert's Rules of Order says. Thank you. You're welcome. Carla Calci. Hi, um, this is piggybacking on a question that came up earlier, which dealt with um, attacking, uh, for lack of better phrasing, that the speaker is being attacked. Um, that's being like bringing up personal information about them, et cetera, that is irrelevant. My question is, if I have someone who is bringing up an issue to say that they're referring to past behavior specific to what's going on, like the person has already done this before and this has already been demonstrated, is that considered irrelevant as well? Should it be objected to or to just let them go ahead and speak on it? No, that does come up later, but I'll go ahead and answer it because it's very specific. There's not a lot to say on it. Um, no one is allowed to speak on a motion that's already been settled or an issue that's already been settled. That's not permitted because it's a sidetrack and it's already been settled. And so it would be like it would be like me speaking on whether or not somebody should have a liquor license down the road and then pausing for a minute and start talking about the good game of golf I had the other day just because I had a good game of golf. Uh, it's irrelevant. It takes time and, it's, it, and nothing can be done about that. It, it has no meaning. Now, when I'm talking about a motion that's, that's already been settled, uh, that's irrelevant, it has no meaning, but, but that discussion's always, already been had. And, and if I'm not careful, I'm speaking against the organization because the vote's been taken. So no, it, you're not allowed to speak. It, that, those statements are out of order uh, if, if, um, if that takes place. Chandra Jones Foster, go ahead. Quick question. You said a motion that's already been settled. It's not actually settled until it is voted on by the body, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And when I say that it's been settled, what I mean is, is again, I've been using the, the example, the hypothetical example of, of dealing with a liquor license. And an mm -hmm. organization down the, down the road um, was, was uh, asking the NPU's opinion and, and they wanted their approval on, on having a liquor license. NPU last meeting voted yes, we're going to grant the liquor license. So the NPU sends that information uh, up to council or the committee as, as the case may be. And then now you here you are in, in, uh, in the next meeting and you've got somebody that says, well, last month we voted to have that, that organization give them a liquor license. And I disagree with that. I don't think we should have done that. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, when it's been, it's not settled until it's voted on. But once it's okay. voted, then you can't speak on it again. So, what if something has not been voted on, and for whatever reason, time is, you know, typically time within the meeting, it's decided by chair or whoever to move on from that. But there's a faction that wants to discuss it how do you respectfully 
make sure that you're following Robert's rules and allowing discussion, so, uh, for lack of a better term. Yeah, no, that's fine. I didn't mean to, I felt like I interrupted you a couple of times. I apologize. No. Uh, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best here. It sounds like the chairperson is taking it upon himself or herself to end discussion on, on a motion and move on to the next one. The chair doesn't have that authority. The only the only entity that can decide to end debate, unless the bylaws provide that authority, the only entity that has the authority to provide the, to end debate is the voting assembly. And they can only do it by two thirds vote or unless they vote on the matter and move on to the next one. But in the middle of debate, if, it, if, if there's still debate going on, the chairperson does not have the authority to say, okay, we're not gonna talk about this anymore, let's move on to the next. That's not, again, unless the bylaws provide that, that authority, that doesn't, that's, that's a, a mistake. It's, not necessarily move on to the next, but say, let's go ahead and vote, or I'm gonna end the discussion, we're gonna vote. Is there a motion? I mean, how do you know what's proper and what's not? Well, um, that's my next point is how everybody should be informed on procedure. Uh, if I was in a meeting and, and that took place and the chair said, okay, well, let's just end discussion here and, um, and let's all vote, I would call a point of order. And I would, and I would um, you know, hopefully I'd be recognized and then I would explain that, that um, you know, the only entity that can end debate and call for the vote is the assembly. Uh, and now if, if, if nobody else wants to talk and the chair has made sure nobody else wants to speak, the proper approach is the chair would say, are you ready for the question? Are you ready to vote in a more colloquial expression? And then if nobody says anything, go ahead and take the vote. But if there's people that have had their hands raised waiting to speak, the chair doesn't, you know, again, just to paint a picture, uh, the chair can't say, okay, we're done now. We're not going to talk about it anymore. Let's just go ahead and vote. The chair, unless the bylaws provide that authority, the chair doesn't have that authority. Oh, Ian um, has her hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I just want to point out, Dennis, I think this is a good time, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about uh, the work that committees should be doing. And the reason that I'm asking you to cover that, even, even if it's just a couple of seconds on that, um, the 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 greatest challenge that I experience or witness in the 25 MPUs is that, maybe not the greatest, one of the greatest challenges is that people want to spend a great deal of time discussing issues that are important to them. And, and sometimes they feel like that's the reason that I came to the MPU meeting to discuss this one issue. And I think that we should spend as much time as we need to discussing it not knowing that the work of vetting these applications that the MPUs are being asked to provide recommendations on should be done at the committee level. Many, if not most, yeah, most of the MPUs do have functioning committees, um, but the committee, the, the people don't attend the committee meetings and they wanna have a committee meeting at the MPU meeting. So can you talk a little bit about how MPUs can use committees to, vet their applications so that these discussions don't have to be 30 or 40 minutes at the MPU meeting? Um, well, uh, Leah, perhaps you and I should have discussed things a little bit before, before this, this training session. Um, typically, typically a committee meeting is just that, it's, it's the committee is gonna do the work. Um, there is, there is a, 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 a a setting where the committee will have an open forum and ask ask everybody's uh, opinions, um, what they what they think ought to happen regarding a certain issue and so on like that. And maybe that's a convenient Leah. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Maybe that's what the MPUs are really going for to help move, move, move things along. Because when everybody gets together, it is it is sort of a um, you know short amount of time to deal with a lot of business. And so I get that. Um, so if, if, if that's the case, if that's what is, is, is best going to function, if that's going to best help 
move the NPE meetings along, then, then um, you know, I, I think that's a good approach. I think that's right. Have the thing settled for, for perhaps, you know, go to the committee meeting. And as they allow you, you know, it's a public hearing is what we're talking about. And as they allow you to provide your opinion, your input and so on, uh, but only that committee can vote in a committee meeting. Only that committee can vote on the issue that's at hand. So you'll get your opinions in and then you'll go ahead and, and let that committee meet and vote. And then they bring it to the NPU meeting. Um, and so and so I to, to speak to the longevity of some discussions, um, perhaps people don't go to the committee meetings, people that can't, maybe they can't make it or maybe they just think it's better to, to deal with it in the NPU. Um, there might, you might want to um, consider laying some ground rules in your bylaws to, to gauge that and to maybe set a time limit. And that's not unusual for an organization. Uh, conventions do it quite a bit for an organization to set a time limit for debate or maybe limit the amount of time that each individual speaker has or something like that. But, but other than that, other, other than special rules, if you've got 100 people in the room, and let's say, let's, and, and I'm not trying to be contrary, I'm just, I'm just trying to follow procedure as it's described in Robert's Rules of Order. If you've got 100 people in the room and committee met, a lot of people went to the committee meeting, and then the committee gives its report, and now there's a motion on the floor from the committee chair, or maybe somebody else made a motion based on the report, and it's been seconded regardless. Um, unless there's a special rule or unless someone asked for a vote or moves for a uh, to call the question, uh, move the previous question, and it wins by a two-thirds vote, uh, that discussion can go on for the for the entirety. Uh, there's no there's no uh, rule in place that says it can't. So so Leah, I hope I'm not I'm not um, causing any any unnecessary challenges here. Um, if oh, that oh, not at all. Um, and what you've said is consistent with what we've said in these classes before and what we've taught before. So. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely uh, cool. If, if, a, if a discussion's gonna go long, it's gonna go long. And there's no, the only thing that you can do about it, one of two things. You can put a rule in your bylaws that says a uh, discussion can only go so far. But remember the bylaws have to be voted on. You can't just a couple of people put it in the bylaws and it's there. So, so um, you would need two thirds notice and two thirds vote uh, to pass that. So, but we're just talking in principle. You yeah, so we, we do, um, Dennis, encourage, in fact, I think it may have been the chair's training. I can't remember which class it was, but we definitely encourage MPUs to uh, consider. And I think this was after talking to you in one of the previous classes about how they can manage their meetings more efficiently so that they're not, you know, some people were having concerns about their meetings. Um, and that's actually how that class was born. But one of the things that we encourage them to do is to adopt time limits on these discussions, which the body, of course, can vote to extend when needed um, or yes, when, yes, yes. when desired, um, I think is more appropriate. But, but yeah, we, we absolutely have encouraged that. And some of them have done that. Some of them have limited discussion for department presentations, for questions from uh, questions for department presentations, for zoning presentations, um, for discussion. That's good. That's good. So I maybe did I address the question? Did I did I get what you wanted? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. 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 All right. Um, Ms. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't know you were. So there were a couple of questions about committees in the chat. Do you want to take those now, Mr. Dennis, or? Um, if, I mean, if, if you're going to come back to it, then we can wait. And also, yeah, let's, let's, let's wait a little bit because it's we, we've done an hour and I'm through one page. We got four pages and I don't mind. <laughs> and, and, and I'll go long if you want me to. I'm OK, but I, I, I do want to I think it, it will be helpful if we can get through the full outline. Ms. James, we're gonna come right back to you first when we go back to questions, okay? If, if that's okay. So I'm just gonna leave your hand up, okay? All right, um, go ahead, um, Mr. Dennis. Okay, in our, in our, thank you, thank you, Samantha. In our question and answer time that we just, that we just uh, did, 
this came up a couple of times at least, it seems like. Um, so here's a quote, and I've got it out underlined. This is out of the introduction of Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, by the way, I'm on page two, Roman numeral two at the top of the page. Parliamentary procedure enables the overall membership of an organization expressing its general will through the assembly of its members. That's what we're talking about here. Both to establish and empower an effective leadership as it wishes, and at the same time to retain exactly the degree of direct control over its affairs that it chooses to reserve to itself. That's a very, very important paragraph because it's your organization. It belongs to the majority of the membership. It belongs to all the membership, but the majority of the membership in any given case will make decisions for the, for the organization. The majority of the voting membership decide who's gonna be in leadership and the majority, the vast majority of membership will decide um, what the bylaws are gonna look like. So, and, and how much, how much uh, authority is gonna retain for itself as an assembly as compared to leadership. So that's very, very important. Keep in mind the, the organization, and again, I, 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 I wanna be careful that I don't insult, but the organization doesn't belong to the leadership. The organization belongs to the membership. Okay, that's important. Learning procedure does take some effort. Uh, again, I pointed out that that it's good to to um, to have a copy of Robert Rules of Order in brief. And once you learn that, to get the bigger book, the Unabridged Robert Rules of Order, uh, newly revised, and uh, that's what I read. But you know, there's things in there that you wouldn't need for an MPU. It talks about conventions and so on. You wouldn't have to worry about that. But it is the it is the thorough book. Um, but but keep in mind when it comes to if you want to be involved in your NPU or in any other organization, maybe it's a church group, maybe it's a club, maybe it's a Kiwanis or something like that. Um, any kind of group where you're going to meet and have meetings and, and vote. Uh, remember that, and I use this a lot. So if I'm being redundant please bear with me. Um, but you had to memorize some rules to get your driver's license. You had to memorize some rules um, to get the permit. Um, when you, if you're gonna be a waiter or a waitress, you have to memorize the menu, at least most restaurants that I've, I'm familiar with, folks that do that kind of work. Uh, I was I was in, uh, uh, I use my computer quite a bit and I ran into a snag. I wasn't sure how to do something. Uh, my son's pretty smart with programs and computers and stuff like that. And I checked with him, he gave me some, some tips and now I know how to do it and I've got it memorized. Uh, when you use computer programs, you have to memorize where to go, which, which tab it's under and which, what to click and a couple clicks down from there, you'll get to the place you need to be. And that's all memorization. Uh, and it's complicated memorization in some computer programs. The reason I'm bringing these things up is because Robert's Rules of Order does take some work to learn you do need to be able to, to uh, do some memorization. It's, but with the basic stuff, it's not that much. It's not that big a deal, but it does take a little bit of work. So you'll be better equipped and you'll, you'll, uh, do, uh, you'll have a much better experience if you know some of the rules. Um, when, if you know the rules, and this is what I put in the, in the outline, when you know the rules, pardon me, yeah, if you know what the rules are, I'm getting lost in my own notes. If you know what the rules are, you'll increase your chances of being heard. And, and I've seen this over and over again. When people feel like they're being railroaded, they'll be, they'll be slow to support you. But what I mean by that is, is if you ignore courtesies, and we're gonna talk in more detail about that, when you know particular courtesies and you know proper procedure and you, and you respect it and you respect others, people are gonna be more apt to listen to you. Uh, you feel strongly about something, keep in mind there's rules, there's guidelines, there's a respectful way to do it. Uh, if you run over that and just and just go full steam ahead and without any regard, uh, then what's going to happen is, is they're not going to want to hear what you have to say. That's just a fact. I mean, I, I see that over and over again. So, so keep in mind, and I've said this already, but I'm going to repeat it. If you speak out of turn or accuse people or, or, or something like that, even if you're right about what you're saying, I mean, you know, you know that place shouldn't have a liquor license and you may be right about that. And maybe time will tell that you were right. 
but if you if you disrespect the rules and disrespect others, you're wrong. Whether you're right or wrong, you're wrong. They won't hear you. And you could have had a chance to really to really uh, provide some good information, but because you uh, um, didn't didn't respect the rules and respect the others, you couldn't deliver the information. Like I said, when that when we first started, it's going to sound like I'm, it almost sounds like I'm in a pulpit I'm preaching. Uh, this is right out of Robert Schulz's order. The things that I'm providing for you is is uh, can be found be found on the pages. Okay. When you know procedure, people will hear the, the they will hear what you have to say. Uh, when people feel like you're playing fair, um, they're most likely to pay attention to you. All right. So take time to learn the rules and the guidelines. Just just again start with uh, Robert's Rules of Order in brief. It's an easy book. Work through that and just a little bit of time a day, and um, and you'll you'll be amazed at the difference that your effectiveness will be when you go into meetings. So let's see. Um, yeah, let me move on. Let me move on just a little bit, all right? And then we'll get some questions again. It is important to practice technical courtesies. And again, this, is, this stuff is right out of Robert's Rules of Order. Do not address the chair by his or her name. And that sounds silly, but it's very important because remember what we're talking about. We're talking about we're talking about dealing with a controversial subject. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions. And every time somebody gets goes to sit down, you got about 10 hands going up and they're all waving their hands. You know, pick me, pick me, I want to speak. And some people are tempted to speak out of turn and so on. And it's one of those. So um, where we find ourselves and what I want to what I want to stress is now there's common courtesies that even in that setting it's going to be very important. It's better, matter of fact, especially in that setting. So let's suppose the chair's name is James. Let's pick the name is James. And if there's a James in here tonight, uh, I'm not picking on you. I'm just I just picked the name. Okay. Let's suppose you know the chair, and uh, it's a controversial subject, and you say you say, hey James, James, this look this I, this is what I really want people to know, and so on like that what the impression is going to be by those who may be new in the meeting or don't know the chair or something like that is that if the chair rules for you in a particular situation that may come up, it's going to look like the chair played favorites for you in some people's mind. And so it is so important, even if you're, even if you're best friends with James, call him Mr. Chairman or, or Madam Chair, uh, whoever, the, whatever the case may be, but but speak in the third person, speak as title, don't use the first name. Because in, in a difficult setting, it's going to look like you're gonna, you're, you're in cahoots with the chair and things are going your way because you know, it sounds silly, but I've watched it over and over again in my experience as a parliamentarian. So these are courtesies that I highly recommend that you observe and, and explain to the chairperson, just say, just say, look, I know we're friends, but I wanna do this right. So I'm just gonna call you chairman. Uh, don't refer to other members by his or her name. Uh, that's important too, because because it's going to look like it's going to look like there's a group of people kind of running the thing. You know, Bob and Susie and James and Joe and, and Debbie and and all these people. You know, all know each other, and you're referring to each other's names. Uh, that's inappropriate. And again, this is right out of Robert Schulz's order. This isn't just something I think is a good idea. Uh, you'll you'll find it in the book. So um, keeping, keeping a sense of, of objectivity is very important. Uh, what you may say is the person that just spoke, uh, the other person that just spoke, or, or, or I know what was just said, but, but I, I kind of disagree and let me explain why. Um, but, but try to stay away from first names if you can and the camaraderie that you might experience on a personal level uh, because that, that complicates the meeting. Um, suppose, and let me give you an example. Suppose a number of people know the chairs. Let's suppose a number of people in the meeting know James, and he has to make a couple of judgment calls that that favor the people that know him. He's being objective. He's going by the rules. But to people who are less informed and may not know the people in the meeting, it's going to look like favoritism. And then what happens? is that the people that know the chairperson and keep calling him by his first name, everybody votes, they vote, and their vote wins. 
even though it was objective, even though it was all fair, even though there was no there was no finagling going on, it's going to it's going to make others feel uncomfortable. They're they're going to be tempted to think that it was that it was done um, by way of knowing the chairman and chairperson, and there was some favoritism there. Now remember our context, and this is important. Remember our context: controversial matters that come up. All these little things become magnified when a controversial matter comes up. This also applies to the chairperson. The chairperson should avoid uh, what uh, should avoid using names because the chairperson likely doesn't know everybody's name. And so again, because there are some people that he or she does know, it's going to look like favoritism. And so imagine, imagine uh, you know, a good friend of the chair in the in the in the in the meeting in the assembly calls a point of order. And then and then calls James by his name. Hey, James, point of order. You know, okay, Bob. We'll tell you what. You're right. Let's do it different. You know, people that don't know any better are going to look at that and go, "Wait a minute," because they know each other. He gets to. Again, I'm stressing this point because you would be surprised and amazed at how much this plays into perception. So keep that. In, again, this is right out of the book. So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing that needs to be uh, spoken to uh, when someone is called out of order. And the way I just said it is even wrong. Uh, someone isn't called out of order. What they said is called out of order. So this is the full paragraph that we started with. I have added a little bit each time to help drive home the points that I'm trying to make. So this is number three under, under Roman numeral 3A. And it says this, when a question is pending, a member can condemn the nature or likely consequences of the proposed measure in strong terms, but he must avoid personalities. And under no circumstances can he attack or question the motives of another member. The measure, not the member, is the subject of debate. Always remember that. If a member disagrees with a statement by another in regard to an event that both witnessed, he cannot state in debate that the other's statement is false. Now, did you catch that? This is Robert's Rules of Order. You know, we're not talking about seconds and is it debatable and is it amendable. We're talking about how to conduct yourself. In a meeting, I'm going to read that sentence again. If a member disagrees with a statement by, an, by another in regard to an event that both witnessed, he cannot state in debate that the other statement is false. Because what you're doing in effect, now I'm talking, I'm not quoting. What you're doing in effect is you're calling that person a liar. And so, so you have to avoid that kind of implication in the last sentence. But he might say, I believe there is strong evidence that the member is mistaken. You're saying the same thing, but you're being more objective, but you're not being personal. So, so that's very, very important to remember. None of this is personal. It shouldn't be. And that's what procedure does for us. It keeps it objective. You don't business, and it keeps personalities out of it. Because if you can define state by opinion, and you can state your opinion, and do it objectively without the personalities coming into play, you'll get a whole Hey, Dennis, you're breaking up again. I, I still miss your signal. You know, we used to start these classes off at the beginning, warning everyone that, you know, we're subject to technology and that sometimes things happen. I haven't had to say that in a while, but I, I did want to let everyone know that we are obviously subject to technology. So thank you for your patience um, if, if the instructor's signal goes in and out. Dennis, can you say something and let's see if it's better? How's it now? Mm. I don't know. Is it raining at your house? <laughs> it's it's still a little um no. but we'll try to we'll try to listen. I, I, there's a window up on my screen that says that um that is weak. The quality is weak. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's weak though, isn't it? It's better. Okay, so that's better. Is it better? Yes. Yes, yes. I've shut everything off on my end. I don't have anything going, no other programs. No, nope, we're good now. I can I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, I Thank don't you. know where I started breaking up, but but let me just let me just say this. Um 
do your best to keep names, personalities, and friendships out of the meeting. Um, do your best to, to, to follow the things that we talked about in these notes to keep it objective uh, so that everybody knows it's just about business and not about a buddy-buddy system. Certain technical features must be kept in mind during debate. And again, these are drawn right out of Robert Schultz's order. Um, there are limits on speeches and the, the limits, and I've provided this before in these classes, two speeches per debatable motion, 10 minutes per speech. That's the default. That's the default rule. So I would think an NPU might, because there are time, because most NPUs like to get out by nine or so, uh, it's, it's my impression, and it's only an impression, but you may wanna, you may wanna uh, pass some, some special rules that, that limit debate to a degree, but that's up to you. Okay, so um, speech time is non-transferable. Uh, I just said you get two speeches and you get 10 minutes per speech. Uh, you can't say, well, I only spoke five minutes. I'm going to give five minutes to my buddy over here. You can't do that. Now, you'll see if you ever pay attention, and I'm going to use this as an example to help you understand the difference. If you ever are in, a, a, in the council chamber during a meeting, uh, you're going to see people that are involved in public speaking. They will donate their time to somebody else. That's a different setting. They're not in debate. They're just, it's, it's just public comment. Um, but when you're a member of an organization, unless the government documents, unless the bylaws state otherwise, you can't transfer time in your debate that you didn't take up. Committee reports do not count as debate. They don't count as debate. Uh, it's just a report and then it'll, it'll um, a lot of times there'll be a proposal that the chair provides then, then debate ensues from there, but a, a report doesn't count as debate. It is not in order to interrupt another speaker. You just don't interrupt. Even though you, you're chomping at the bit, you're sitting on the edge of your seat and you can't wait to get your hand up, be patient. Don't interrupt somebody. You wouldn't want them to interrupt you. Don't interrupt them. These are, these are things, and all these things that I just talked about, uh, the chair should be on top of it and the chair should call these things out of order. Mr. C Mr. Dennis, are you taking questions right now? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take some questions. Ms. James, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one regarding the committees, and um, I attended the other parliamentary procedures training mm -hmm. some months back, and so I have a question that of something I thought was said there, and then something that was said here, and then uh, a question about how to address someone if. Other than the chair, I know you say Madam, uh, uh, our chair is, a, is, a, is a, a female, so it would be Madam Chair. But other than that person, how would you address somebody if you're not supposed to address them by their name? But um, so that's my third question. Um, but as far as committees, um, I'm a little confused about the committees. Uh, I know Miss uh, LaRue brought up uh, the committees and you addressed that. But I'm a little confused. Um, like, for instance, if if I, I, in our MPU, I'm not aware that we're invited to uh, committee meetings. Um, and so, am I to understand that when the committee meets, if they make a ruling on something, take a vote and 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 make a vote on something, they bring their vote back to the body. Is is that how I'm understanding that. Let me and, jump in, Dennis, if, if I may, and then you can clean up after me, Dennis. <laughs> um, committees don't make rulings. They make recommendations to the body. And um, secondly, all committee meetings of MPUs are required by law, by code, to be open to the public. That is not an MPU's decision to make. It's not a chairperson's decision to make. It's not an executive board or, or anyone else. It, it's not even a Roberts rule decision. The, the city law 
requires that all NPU meetings and all NPU committee meetings must be open to the public. Those are the only two pieces that I wanted to respond to specifically. Dennis, you can take it from that's, there. That's, that's accurate. Um, and, and thank you for, for uh, um, providing that, Leah. With okay, that so, in mind. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Conway. Yes. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's okay. Um, um, with that in mind, the public is is a, is supposed to be allowed to attend, and and Lee is right. Um, the the committee doesn't make a ruling. It could be, you could loosely use that term if they vote. That's that's what they've decided. It's not really a ruling, but they've just, they've made a decision. Um, but but the the public can attend. They can't speak unless allowed to be to, unless they're allowed to speak by the committee. They can't enter into debate with the committee unless the committee says we want to hear what you have to say, and then the committee will vote. If there's something that they need to vote on, the committee will vote and they'll take that recommendation to the NPU, and then the NPU then they'll report to the NPU what they voted on, and uh, and go from there. So let me let me pause for just a second, and uh, Miss Larue, if you would if you would uh, uh, help me out here just for a second. Do you want to uh, forego the rest of these notes and, and uh, focus on committee questions from this point forward? No, I, I only see two hands raised. So I definitely want to cover as much as you can cover. Um, okay, are these notes what you're looking for? Are these notes sufficient? Or just make sure uh, are, what, you, what you want is for me, for me to just make sure and answer committee questions as they come up. Yeah, any, any questions that are relevant to the course content we definitely want to this is probably a good time to point out that this this setting is for educational purposes and training it is not designed to work out the problems in your individual mpu or your specific um questions or problems that you have it's it, it just it's a disservice to everyone else in the in the class that may not have those specific issues in their MPU. So if, if your question is just MPU specific or about, you know, if your concern is not really parliamentary, but more so how your chair operates, let's handle that separately so that everyone else can get all of the good parliamentary education. Okay, I just wanted to make sure our notes were on, on topic, okay. I think Miss James had, I know that was one of her questions, but I think she had another question and I didn't want to cut her off. Okay, okay. that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in the um, other parliamentary training, um, I thought I understood it to be said that if uh, there's something voted on or a matter discussed or um, a topic that comes up and it happens at one particular meeting, but you want it, you want to address it later, say if the, the meeting was um, um, adjourned and you didn't get a chance to answer, to ask your question or whatever, that you can bring it up um, later on. And, um, and so in, during this meeting, um, I thought it was said that if you vote on something um, or if something is voted on, uh, you can't bring it up at another time, which for me is confusing because it, if something was voted on and you didn't get a chance to voice what you, what you wanted to say or, or there was a question about the voting, whatever, and you, I'm confused of whether you can bring it up and whether you cannot bring it up at a later meeting. Okay. Um, so aside from any aside from any limits on debate or or for whatever reason you didn't get a chance to speak, um, and I'll address that if 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 that's if that's pertinent to your question. But let me paint a scenario. Um, so so uh, an issue was voted on at the last meeting. It's been decided. The only way you can speak on it at the next meeting is to make a motion to, to amend something previously adopted or re, to rescind something previously adopted. Okay. And so you can make that motion. If it's seconded, 
then that brings that up again. And that can only pass by a two thirds vote unless you give notice, it's kind of complicated, unless you give notice at the last meeting, then it can be passed by a majority vote. But nonetheless, what we were talking about, what my point was this evening is a scenario where you're not moving to bring it back up again and to look at it again, uh, to maybe change it or, or rescind it, you're talking about something totally different and you just, your mind just goes there and you start, you know, getting all upset about what happened the last meeting. I didn't like that either. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Okay. Okay. Did that okay. answer the question? Yes, it did. And the last thing was how you should, you, you've been, it's been said that you can't address somebody or shouldn't address somebody by their name. And I'm not speaking of the chair, but any other person that you want to address, oh, okay. how should you address them? Well, um, one of the things, and I'm going to get to this, but that's okay. It, it, you know, it comes up in the questions. And this is a minor point. Not a minor point, but there's not a lot to say about it. All of your discussion should take place by speaking to the chair. Let's suppose, and it's going to sound silly, but let's suppose you and your buddy are sitting together, you and your friend are sitting together, your neighbor, and you're sitting right there. Your neighbor stands up, and they're sitting right next to you, and they say, I think that the ABC store down the street should have a liquor license. And then they sit down. You stand up and I mean, you're sitting right next to them. You know, everything in you is going to want to turn to them and say, I disagree. I think it's wrong. Actually, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at the chair. All discussion is to go through the chair. You're not supposed to turn to others and speak to them directly in a meeting. And this is very important when you're talking about a controversial subject because the chair is supposed to be just a referee. The chair is supposed to be objective. The chair is supposed to not care one way or another. That's the posture they're supposed to keep. And so when, when we're talking liquor license and whether or not ABC organization should have a liquor license, even though my neighbor, my good friend, my best friend sit right next to me, I'm gonna to speak to the chair and I'm gonna say, the person that just spoke believes they should have a liquor license. I can't help it, I disagree. And this is why I disagree. Okay. So you really don't even have to refer to the person except for what was just said, because okay. you're not speaking to that person. You're always okay. speaking to the chair. Okay, thank you very much. Very welcome. Taryn Bill? Yes, Dennis, uh, before you cut out the last time, you were saying that it's not appropriate to say, um, basically, calling someone a liar saying that's not true and you started to break up you said instead say um x y and z can you go back to that yes what i did is i was quoting robert's rules of order it's um chapter 43 paragraph 21 and the statement says what you might say instead of saying that was false what you might say is i believe there's strong evidence that the member is mistaken so it's okay to say that they're mistaken, but it's not okay to say you just told an untruth or you just lied. Because now you're talking about the person, now you're accusing them of wrongdoing. And it's never appropriate to say that somebody has done something wrong when you're in a meeting. Now let me, and, and um, so, 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 so um, Ms. Bell, let me, let me say it this way. Organizations do have the privilege and the right to deal with somebody who's done something wrong. So it's not that anybody can just get away with anything. Now it's a little bit unique with MPUs. So, so, and, and so you have to, to work on that in that context, but nonetheless, the very last chapter in Robert's Rules of Order has to do with discipline. And even though you know somebody did something wrong, let's suppose, let, let, let's just get, get real strong here. Let's suppose you know they took money from the organization. You know they did tell a lie or they false information on an important document or something like that, what you would do is instead of saying, I know you took money or I know you lied you know, in, a, in a business meeting, what you would say is you would stand up and you'd say, I move that we establish a committee to look into to this question. And it's a little bit more than that, but, but, but the point I wanna make is, is that rather than calling people out and accusing them of doing wrong, it's not that you can't deal with somebody that's done something wrong, but there's a procedure for it. And it starts with a committee to look into it. So, so that was that was the point. Received. Thank you. You're very welcome. 
Any other questions? Carly Cossie, I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Okay. No problem. Um, hi, um, Mr. Conway. Um, this is a combination of the timing that you said there's a time when the speaker speaks or someone's giving their opinion and also the question like with a combination question. If a person raises their hand, they're recognized by the chair to give their opinion and they say, um, initially they, they place the question to the floor. There's a bit of debate there. Then they say, I'm not finished. And they basically, they're adding a question onto what they said previously. Um, as far as the rules, how does that work? The other one is that the way I have been handling it because I really didn't understand it as much is that if the person up front tells you, I have two questions and they state the first one, there's a little debate on it. Then we come back to them for the second one and go from there. Is there ever a point where you don't have to go back to the second one because maybe the debate has just gone on and on and on and the other question is irrelevant? So basically, do you really need to go through the second question or do those questions need to be recognized up front? And if they're not recognized up front, is that, um, you know, how does the time work with that? So if we're doing the five minutes, you've got your first question, we've gone through five minutes. <laughs> do we go back and do it again? I mean, how, how does that work? Well, I'll try to address questions in general. Maybe I'll, you asked a lot there. And uh, so, but I, but I understand, I mean, and I'm glad you did. So, so help me through it if I, if I miss the point. Um, so I'll start with basics. For a committee report, if somebody's asking a question about a committee report, that's legitimate. It's just a question and they're doing the report. If somebody has, if somebody's speaking on a subject, somebody is saying, you know, ABC uh, organization down the street, they, they've done this, they've done that, and I think they deserve their liquor license. I, as a member, can stand up and say, will the member that's speaking entertain a question? And, or will he yield for a question? And if he doesn't yield for the question, if the, if the member says no, then I can't ask the question. Then I sit back down. Okay, so if the member does yield for the question, unless the bylaws state otherwise, the time that takes is deducted from his time or her time. So that's one of the reasons why that you have to ask. You, they're standing up, they're speaking, and you stand up. And maybe, and if I was chair, I would say, for what purpose does the member rise? Uh, will will the person speaking yield for a question? And if they say yes, then I'll ask the question, and then he'll answer it or she'll answer it. Or if they say no, I just sit back down. If if there's if there's nobody else speaking, and I'm going to stand up for debate, then I ask a question. In my mind, that's rhetorical, and that counts as debate. And you, you see what I'm saying? In other words, so 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 this person just stood up and they're talking about um, how ABC organization should have should have a liquor license and I think they're great and I think it'll be fine and everything's good and then they sit down. And then I stand up and I say, well, what are we gonna do about all the little kids who are gonna be able to get alcohol in the neighborhood because this organization has a liquor license and I sit down. That's not a question, that's a point. That's debate. And so it depends on the context. That's why I put it that way. Does that help? It does. Um it's, uh, it helped a lot. And the other part of that was if, let's say liquor license, I say, I have two questions. One, is this a, um, is this liquor license being transferred from the previous owner? And then there's some kind of debate. So I never really get to my second question. Are we obligated to go back to them for the second question? But I think what you said is that if they agree to um, entertain like someone did a rebuttal and it became a bit of a debate it's under the original time so we do not have to go back to that second question when he said I had two questions because that first question really took up all the time yeah if, if, if somebody stands up and says I have a question um, is this, is not, I can't remember how you put it but um, if see when you stand up for debate it's you mm -hmm. it's your show you have the floor and you can say well, I want to know one thing Who's going to clean up this mess? And if all you hear is crickets, then that's all you get. 
Nobody's obligated to ask your question, answer your question. You're, you're just, you're up there to make your point. You're not up there to, to, to directly challenge people and, and, and say, you need to answer this. Well, no, they don't. You are up there to make your point. You're up there to, to, to state your case. And if I was, if I was, if I was in that position, and I have been, and I would think that a that a, 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 a hard punch question would really drive the point home, then I would do that. I would ask the question, I would say some things, ask the question, I'd sit down. And then, you know, everybody, boy, if I did it right, that's a good question right there, boy, you know, and maybe, and then probably if it was a good question, somebody would stand up and address it. But nobody's obligated to answer anybody's question. It's, it's, it's your show. I mean, you've got the floor. You, you say what you want and do what you want. Now the committee chair may oblige that. And you as, as the chairperson may say, um, does the committee chair want to answer that? You know, that's a courtesy, but, you know, again, when it's, when it's my turn for debate, that's, that's all she wrote. I don't, I don't know if that helps. We have a couple of questions that were in the chat. Um, let's see. Okay, there, there's some confusion still about committees, committee recommendations. When, rec, when they bring them back to the body, what happens if the body disagrees? If okay, it's it's okay. That's fine. So let's say let's say again we're using the ABC organization and they want a liquor license. So the committee looks at it. And, and the, the, the community, you know, is all attending the committee meeting. Everybody that can and wants to, they're attending the committee meeting. And the committee votes and says, we think ABC ought to get a liquor license. Then what the committee does, the committee goes to the MPU meeting and a lot of people were in attendance there. They, if the committee allowed them to speak, they spoke, they gave their opinion and they voted the way that the committee voted the way the committee wanted to vote. And that's, that's the way it goes. But what the committee is doing, and Leah pointed this out a little early, earlier, what the committee is doing is voting to give a recommend, recommendation to the MPU. And that's all it is. The committee doesn't make a decision for the MPU. The committee is making, is deciding what it wants to recommend to the MPU. So um, the committee decides that ABC organization should have a liquor's li liquor license. It brings that recommendation to the body. The body debates it and votes it down. That's just the facts. That's just the way it goes. The NPU didn't agree with the committee, and that's okay, by the way. If you're on a committee and, and the NPU or the, your whatever organization you're in, uh, the, 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 or, the, the, the body votes your recommendation down as a committee, don't take it personal. You're just a, you're just a group of people that uh, a, a small representation of the body who, was, who, who were asked to do some research on a question on the matter. And once discussion ensues in the main meeting, and people finally decide after hearing the report and entering into the discussion, they decide to vote it down. Don't take it personal. You did your job. You did what you were supposed to do. You, you, you met as a committee, you listened to people perhaps, regardless, you brought your recommendation to the meeting and they decided they have the right to decide and they have the responsibility to decide. Don't take it personal. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, Samantha, Mr. Martin raised a, a good point because I've seen a couple of his questions kind of throughout, but I haven't heard them read aloud. Okay, monitoring is long, so. And I know that, I, I do want to point this out. I, Personally, I'm not a fan of questions in the chat only because it's very hard to scroll up in Zoom. Zoom's scroll feature is just not user-friendly at all. And it makes it difficult to scroll up and see older questions, but um, and the recommendations. I find that ad hominem equals inappropriate. Um, 
Mr. Conway, I think that's what Mr. Martin, one of the questions he was asking. Ad hominem? Mm -hmm. Ad hominem means against the person or against the man. And you can't speak ad hominem in a debate. Mr. Martin, go ahead. I, I... Oh, God. Mr. Martin, you're breaking up. I, I can't hear you unless you're muted. Sorry. Yes, I, I keep trying to unmute myself. I'm, I'm muted now, right? You're, yeah, you're, 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 okay, yeah. sorry. Um, the first question I asked was about withdrawing a motion. And it was something that came up very recently in one of my MPU meetings. So if a mover makes a motion and it's properly seconded, and my second question was about properly seconding motions, um, and then the mover says, oh, I'd like to withdraw that motion, how should the chairman of the meeting handle that statement? If I was if I was chairing the meeting, see, technically a person can't withdraw a motion because once it's moved and seconded, that it belongs to the assembly. So technically speaking, well, they can and they can't. So so if a person says, because I've chaired meetings where people have done that before, and so uh, in one meeting somebody said I want to withdraw my motion, I said, are there any objections? And there were no objections. So that means that it's, it implies a vote, they get to withdraw. So that's how I've handled that. In another meeting that I was chairing, uh, somebody wanted to withdraw their motion. I said, are there any objections? And the person said, yes, I object. We voted on it and the, the motion could not be withdrawn. And so the motion, the motion stayed before the body. I don't know if that answered your question, Mr. Martin. Um. Yes, it, it did. I, I, I had actually searched online and found several different answers to the same question. So I was I was okay. curious to know which and yours was consistent with one of them. OK, well, that's good to know. So, yeah. So I, I, I just I the way I handled it was I said the question before the body, we have to resolve it. Let's vote yay or nay and then move on. Um, but but the other question that I had posted in the chat since we're on this topic was about properly seconding. So what, what happens in a lot of our meetings is someone will say, I move that we do this, that, or the other. And someone will promptly say, I second that. And my understanding of Robert's rules is that until the chair has read the motion and said, would anyone like to second it, you can't just blurt out, I second that. Is that correct? Actually, uh, a person can, as soon as they hear the motion, a person can from the floor, they can do as little as say second. Before. So, so, so at that point, a motion has been made and properly seconded, and belongs to the body. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, not quite yet. <laughs> not quite yet, because what's important here is that it's moved and it's seconded, and I, I move that ABC, you know, organization gets their liquor license second, and then the chair says, okay, it's been properly moved and seconded that the ABC organization gets their liquor license. Now it's before the body. The chair must be able to, to, to state the motion to the assembly. The reason is, is because if the person make, making the motion is misstates it or, or is unclear or the motion's out of order, the chair needs to be able to navigate that. Even if the person has seconded it, uh, as chair, you have a responsibility to go to the person who made the motion, make sure it's clear, make sure everything's right. And let's suppose that the idea was that the ABC organization would get their liquor license. And this person says the CDF organization gets their liquor license. And then the person seconds it. And then you say, wait a minute, did you mean CDF or did you mean ABC? Oh, oh I meant ABC. Well, then the person that seconded it said, well, I would withdraw my second. Because he was seconding something different and he can withdraw his second at that point. But chances are somebody else was seconded anyway. But but I don't know if that helps you. It does, thank you. Okay, yes, you're very welcome. Other questions, Samantha? There appears not to be any in the chat. And I, okay. yeah, I think we've covered those. Okay, all right. We're on Roman numeral number four. Excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. I was trying to get off mute. I do have a question. Um, okay. The gentleman who asked the questions around 
withdrawing emotion. Yes. I think I heard some ambiguity, at least it was ambiguous to me regarding the answer to that. I thought I heard you say that once emotion is moved and properly seconded, it belongs to the assembly at that point. Yes. And technically it cannot be withdrawn. However, the alternatives to that that you gave were um, <clears throat> one, a person can say, I withdraw my motion. I'd like to withdraw my motion. The chair can ask if there are any objections to that. Yes. And no one objects, and therefore the motion can be removed. Yes. The second example was someone can say, I'd like to remove um, that. My, uh, I'd like to withdraw my motion. Yes. And say, are, are there any objections? And if there are, then they can take a vote. Yes. So are they voting to to withdraw the motion or are they voting down the motion at that point? No, that's, that's a good question. It's a very good question. They're actually voting to allow the person to withdraw the motion. It's a special request. Um, it does belong to the assembly. That's why it's up to the assembly. And that's why um, commonly, just like adopting minutes or approving minutes, commonly when somebody requests to, to uh, withdraw a motion, uh, unanimous consent is, is, is the mechanism that a lot of chair persons will use, um, myself included, because it, it, it makes it simple. And so when they, when they ask them to, to withdraw a motion, I'll say, well, is there, is there any objection? Um, no, okay, so what that means is, is technically speaking, they have, they have, for that special request, have voted to allow that person to withdraw the motion. So it belonged okay. to the assembly, the assembly gave it back to me. Gotcha. So it's when just, I when I say vote by acclamation, yes, that's another term that's usually used for elections. But but yes, that's that's what's taking place. Thank you. Very well. Okay, we have a question from Sabira Jones. Go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Hey, thanks. So my question was back to the discussion about disruptive um, um, members and meetings, and you said not to address them directly to have a committee, um, I guess, kind of do a search um, or research into the behavior. My question around that was with meeting committee meetings being public, um, that person can attend the meeting, which is fine, but how do you prevent the person from participating in the committee if they're the ones that is being investigated? Okay, your, your question has two levels. And so let me speak to the first level. Uh, you talked about an unruly person. Uh, when, I was, when I was speaking about getting a committee up, I was speaking about a member knowing of something that another member has done wrong. Um, you know. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. When I said un unruly, that's actually what I meant when we we're talking about investigating someone. Um, okay, okay, okay. Fraud, deceit, right, right, fraud, right. You know, things like that. Rather than being rather than being an annoyance in the meeting. So so I'll I'll, I'll go ahead and speak to that anyway, because it does go to that when you're asking about committee, the committee meeting. If somebody keeps interrupting in a meeting and the chair continually, continually warns them, then, and it depends on the NPU rules, and Leah and, and Samantha would help um, be a better help here than, than I because all the bylaws are different. But um, they can be, generally speaking, um, they can be asked to leave by the assembly if they don't get back in line, if they, if they don't stop being disrupted. So that's one way to deal with a disruptive member. It's happening in front of everybody. They keep interrupting. They speak out of turn. They step up. They're they're you know they're calling people out. Um, that can be that can be dealt with on the spot. Um, as far as the committee is concerned, that I don't know what the rules are. I don't know I don't know what um, what's what the Open Meetings Act provides. Uh, I know what I know what you can do as a as a, a 
for a private organization when when uh, you've got visitors in your committee meeting and they won't behave uh, they won't they won't you know they keep interrupting and stuff or try to speak and they're not supposed to but i have to admit um the chairperson is uh, short of knowing the details for the open meetings act in that case in that scenario uh, the chair should should promptly say please uh, you're not a member of the committee um, we will give chance we, we will give if, if the committee is going to do this we will give a chance later on for members of the community to speak on this question, but for now, please let the committee do its work and we'll let you speak in a moment. Um, the chair plays a huge role in keeping things on track and keeping people on track. And most people, not always, but most people will respect the wishes of the chair, especially if they think they're gonna have an opportunity later to speak to their point. I don't know if that helped. I think we can keep going. Um, Let me just jump in real quickly. I, I do want to take the opportunity since we're on the subject, um, Sagira, in response to your question and other MPUs have had similar questions around the city. Um, what we encourage kind of as a best practice is for those MPUs that are, so there are some MPUs that have more of a town hall format kind of where anyone can speak at any time for anything or whatever. Um, and then most, of course, are more orderly and more organized or, or differently organized and, and more orderly. Um, what I encourage is that if you're <clears throat> if you're the committee chair and you've got a bunch of people that are present at the committee meeting because they're interested. So first, let me say this as as members, if you're not if you're an MPU member, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to say this the best way. If you're if you're an MPU member, but you're not a member of the committee and you're really interested in this one matter, the best thing to do is to communicate with a committee member or multiple committee members before the meeting and express your position or your concern or whatever it is. The second thing I would point out is that if you're the committee chairperson or you're in leadership, it is a good idea to open up the floor for public comment at the end of your meeting, at the beginning of your meeting, in the middle of your, wherever. It's just a good idea just because of the nature of this work. Um, it's a little different than you know, a Baptist church or a sorority or, or whatever else. This is, this is a little bit different. Um, these are, you're dealing with residents who have an actual interest in what happens and what recommendations and decisions the MPU makes. So I just strongly encourage everyone to have a public comment period, even if you only give people a little bit of time to, you know, get it off their chest or, or feel heard. And then to those that are looking to um, be heard, it's a good idea to communicate with the committee members who are the ones that are doing the voting. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Very, very well. Very good point. Are there other questions? All right, so we are under Roman numeral number four capital letter A, and like I said, this is where I start sounding a little preachy. Well, I have already, but I'm going to do some, some more. But, but let me remind you, this is all out of Robert Ford's order. Parliamentary procedure is, is, is about much more than just the rules of motions. Um, when people think of Robert Ford's order, that's typically what they think about is, does it have to be seconded? Is it debatable? Is it amendable? What, what motion is in order and when? And all of that is very, very important. But it's also about um, it's also about respect. If, if, if you don't respect each other, if you don't respect the other people in the room, the rules are going to have, they're going to be handicapped. They're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to uh, limp along because, because this is, uh, and they go a long ways toward, toward implementing and promoting that respect. But you must respect the fact that everybody else in the room has, has uh, just the same rights that you have. And they have a right to be respected. They have a right to be treated properly, um, even if their ideas sound off. You know, if you're going to roll your eyes, do it so nobody sees it. If you're going to groan, then, then try not to. 
Um, let somebody say something that doesn't that doesn't sound like it's a good idea, because some of the best ideas at first blush sounded like they were off and sounded like they were cockeyed. So everybody everybody has equal rights in the room. Make sure that you allow that person even to say something that sounds off. Let them be wrong. Let them give an opinion that's a mistaken opinion and respect them for it. Uh, that will go a long ways toward difficult discussions when things are controversial. Proper contact, uh, pa pardon me, proper conduct also promotes efficiency. Uh, we talk about wanting to get things done at a proper time. If you do things properly and use proper conduct, you'll get done a lot sooner than if you don't as a, as a membership. Only talk about what is pending. We've already spoken to that. Don't go back and talk about other things that were already decided. Do not talk about another, do not question another per, per person's motives. We've talked about that. Do not speak against one's own motion. Don't make a motion and then, you know, in the middle of the discussion, start speaking against it. Robert's Rules doesn't allow that. And by the way, all these things the chair should be privy to and the chair should call such, uh, such speech out of order. Um, reading from material is only permissible if the assembly allows it. A lot of times this is done by unanimous consent, but don't, you need to understand you can't just st stand up and start reading from a book that you've read because it's pertinent to the point or start reading a poem that you wrote or quoting a song. Um, you, you, can't, you can't do that without permission. And like I said, usually a chairperson will, if there are no objections, the member will go ahead and read from this. You know, how long is it? Just one page? Okay. If there are no objections, they're going to read this page. No objections, continue. So, so you don't have a right to just stand up and start reading stuff. So keep that in mind. Uh, do not disturb the assembly. Make sure that if you have to get up and dismiss yourself from the room, you do it as quietly, as respectfully as possible. Uh, remember when we first started, I talked about how what your, your goal is, is to help the organization and is to help the majority of the people in the room make a well-informed decision. And so it's not to get your way. Uh, if everybody follows your ideas or mine and, and at the, at the exclusion of their own opinions, then we got trouble. So it's a deliberative body. It just needs to function that way. So don't disturb when it's when it's time when you have to if you have to dismiss yourself for a reason now there's some there's some common missteps that will that will quickly spur on conflict and i'm just going to emphasize these briefly um, before we you know and it's going to sound like i'm repeating myself i kind of am but the reason i'm doing this is because if you're trying to be a part of the solution if you're trying to be somebody that's going to promote good orderly meetings you'll avoid these things specifically and especially um, the, the assembly does not want to hear you criticize something that's already been decided. It's already been talked about. We already, we already went into a lengthy discussion about this. Please don't go into it again. Um, you're not going to win any points in there. They're going to see it as a waste of time. And any time, anything you wanted to say about this particular point that's, that's immediately pending, you've just lost them. So don't make that mistake. Don't start talking about decisions that were made in the past and complaining about them in the middle of your speech because that will that will uh, you won't you won't get any points that way and remember you're trying to endear yourself and you're trying to convince for their sake the majority of the voting members no member appreciates being interrupted nobody does uh, i i it's, it's 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 funny to watch as a parliamentarian uh, somebody will interrupt somebody and they'll say excuse me can i finish you know and the chair tries to jump into when they, if, if they're doing their job. And then they'll turn right around and do that to somebody else. Uh, it's funny how we think. We don't like being interrupted, but when, when it's a heated debate, we're real quick to interrupt somebody else. If you want to have a meeting that's full of conflict, interrupt. That's going to that's gonna make it happen. So, so of course, I'm being, I'm being rhetorical. Um, if you want things to stay calm, if you want things to stay respectful, if you want things to stay on point, if you want to do good business, well-informed business, don't interrupt. And one more thing along these lines, no member likes being accused of wrongdoing. Uh, we, get, we get feeling pretty strong about our point. And because we're human, and I said at the very beginning, because we're human, we're going to, we're, we're tempted 
to to uh, get suspicious of people that are disagreeing with us. It's a temptation that we all have. In the middle of a controversial subject in a heated debate, then if I if if I'm not careful, I'm going to ruin the meeting. I'm going to cause conflict. I'm going to hurt feelings. I'm going to make things very difficult for everybody if I accuse somebody of something. So those three things, in my experience, those th three things, if you're looking to side rail a meeting and cause conflict in your organization and, and reduce the chances of success, those three seem to be biggies in my experience. And that's what I'm basing it on. Uh, those three are all from Robert Fool's order as things that you're not allowed to do. But I'm just telling you from a person who's been, um, who's been in a lot of meetings, those, those are biggies, those are biggies. So again, the chair must enforce these things. It's the chairperson's responsibility to be on top of things and not allow these things to happen. Excuse me. <coughs> All right. We're on Roman numeral number five, unless there's a question, uh, Smith. All right. Roman numeral number five, certain motions can help bring order. Uh, this, this was brought up a while back. I've got sections 23 and 24 cited in Robert's Rules of Order. A point, a point of order is, is intended to restore order. If you see that the chair did a, uh, made a missed call or the chair isn't calling something to order that it should be in order, then it is proper. You don't have to wait for anybody, yeah, but do it respectfully. Don't, don't, be, don't be rude, don't be unkind, don't you know, be respectful. Uh, stand to your feet if that's, if that's, if that's protocol. Robert Schultz Board describes it that some meetings have different protocol. So, so stand your feet and just say point of order. And the chair, if the chair is doing their job properly, they're going to turn and say, what is your point, uh, me uh, member? And um, then you describe where you think the mistake has been made. So don't be afraid to do that. Don't, don't, don't use it as a, this is one area, this is one area where people can um, abuse the, the, the motion, and it is called a motion. The point of order is an incidental motion. It can be abused. I'll tell you a quick little story. Maybe I've told it before. Um, and if the chair knows his or her job, they'll know and be able to tell whether or not it's dilatory. For somebody to raise a point of order, the first point of order, and they raise a point of order in a meeting, I'll always entertain it. I'll always make sure that I understand what they're, what they're talking about. And I'll make a ruling on it if I'm chairing the meeting. And then so we move on. But if it keeps happening, if that same person, every other step, it's point of order, point of order, point of order. Well, now it's becoming dilatory, meaning it's a stall tactic. And uh, it's a misuse of the motion. Remember, all proper uses of motions all lead to one place, a, a, a fair vote of the assembly. And so, so but to keep raising a motion, um, point of order over and over and over again, that's dilatory. I was in a meeting where that happened. Uh, as a matter of fact, they just kept screaming it. And uh, so it, at a certain point, we tried to enter, I was the parliamentarian and a chairperson, I was, it was a woman, I was helping her chair the meeting, um, giving her advice as she chaired. And uh, finally she was flustered and it was, it was all just a, a tactic to, to, to disrupt the meeting. That's what it was, it was a whole group of them. And I said, just take the vote, just ignore them and take the vote. And that's in the rules. That's in the rules. I wasn't, I wasn't a tantrum. It wasn't, it wasn't just uh, me trying to get them back. Uh, that's procedure. So, um, but in most cases, in every case, in most every case, I'll put it that way. Don't, don't be afraid to raise a point of order. And if you're the chairperson, don't, don't think it disrespectful. A point of order is a proper, is a proper move. And it is one that you entertain and take it seriously, because as somebody has already pointed out in our question and answer session, um, Robert Schultz's order is a very thick book in semi-fine print. There's a lot there. I'll make missteps sometimes, um, hopefully not as many as others, but, but there's a lot there to remember. And so I've missed points on occasion where I'm parliamentarian in the meeting, somebody will raise a point of order, They'll, the chair will turn back and look at me and I'll say, no, that point's well taken. And uh, sometimes I've just ignored it for, for other reasons because there was something more weighty that was taking place. But, but um, the main, the main uh, matter that I'm trying to bring up here 
is that a point of order is a proper move. It is not disrespectful. It is not. It is not. Um, it's not to be taken personal or is disruptive. It's very important to allow people to do that. The second motion that is good for for an orderly meeting is an appeal from the decision of the chair. And I've only seen it happen one time. Uh, another one meeting they were going to do it. They changed their mind because they didn't want to do that to their chairperson. Uh, another meeting I was chairing the meeting and they and they appealed from from one of my rulings and that they have the right to do that. Um, if a chair makes the wrong decision, then you would appeal. Somebody would make a motion. I appeal for the decision of the chair. Somebody seconds it. And Robert Schulz Warder talks about how that should be processed. If it's if it's a, a in the middle of a debatable motion, then that's debatable. The appeal is debatable. Each person gets one chance to speak. The chair gets twice. He gets one up front and one at the end. And then there's a vote. And the question is, shall the chair's ruling be sustained? And if the chair doesn't win the day, then he's overruled. A tie goes to the chair. But the but and Robert Schulz Warder. Excuse me, Robert sort of rules of order. It, it it talks about that process. But but again, the point I'm making is, is that if things are starting to get a little bit out of whack, it's not wrong to call a point of order. And it's and, and in more more uh, grave situation, it's not wrong to uh, appeal from the decision of the chair. Um, be 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 sure about your point though. Um, if you just if you're not sure about something. Uh, I'm not sure I would call, uh, I would appeal from the decision of the chair if I really wasn't sure about it. I would ask the question and I would ask for a, 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 an opinion. But but those two motions are are, uh, are very important for keeping things orderly and, and moving along properly, especially in controversial matters. And a chair needs to be uh, mindful of the fact that it's not personal. Nobody should take it personal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what it does also is it reminds everybody who has the final say. It's the it's the voting majority of, of the assembly. Okay, so number six, and we're coming down the home home stretch. If there are no uh, questions, Samantha, I'll continue. All right, we must always practice procedure. This is the last point. Proper procedure is what makes a meeting efficient and productive. And I know I just sounded like I repeated myself. I could have just said that for the whole, whole class, right? Well, let me let me repeat myself. This is this is what we're talking about tonight, and this is very important. Simply asking people to, to be polite won't be enough, especially if you're talking about a controversial matter. And, and there's a lot of strong emotions in the room. There's a lot of strong opinions in the room to just stand up there as a chairperson and say, now everybody be nice to each other. Um, yeah, okay, we'll be nice, but I'll tell you what, no, no liquor license is gonna happen down my street. I can tell you that right now. Because people have strong opinions about what, they're, about what they want to see happen. And so, um, so, so keep that in mind. When a matter is controversial, proper procedure is more effective than saying, just please be nice. Let me repeat that. When a matter is controversial, proper procedure is much more effective than just asking people to be nice. A lot of times um, you get a group of people, you feel like you've got a good organization and, and everybody's, everybody's uh, you know, after the meetings, they'll talk a little bit, hang around and talk in the parking lot and laughing and joking and, and going to the house. And that's usually your experience. And then somebody brings up something controversial or a committee has to bring up something controversial and all of a sudden things aren't like that now. All of a sudden people are struggling and people are interrupting each other and the chair is scrambling trying to figure out what to do. And, and then the chair says something like, wait a minute now everybody, why can't we just talk this through? Just be nice. Um, I've seen it and it's not effective. It doesn't help. Uh, proper procedure is, is what's gonna keep things on track, proper procedure is what's gonna keep people from hurting each other's feelings. Proper procedure is what's gonna help the organization in a tough spot, in a controversial matter, it's proper procedure that's gonna help an organization make the best informed decision possible, not making a plea for everybody to just be nice and love each other. That all means something, that all means a lot. I'm not trying to be dismissive, I'm not trying to be unkind, um, but, but you can get a, and I've said this before, I say this a lot. 
you can have a, a room full of, of very, very good people and kind people, and respectful people. But when things get controversial, they don't have any guidelines. If they don't have any guidelines for, for deliberations, then things get off the rails, even with really good people. So keep that in mind. This is, this is what this is about. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times you're going to have meetings. As a matter of fact, I would, I would dare say most of your meetings are going to be formalities. It's going to be just clipping along. You're doing the things that you always do, and there's no nothing controversial, and so and 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 so on. There's there's not much going on. It's just we did it. We're done. We're going home and watching TV. These meetings may give a sense, and 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 I'm kind of repeating myself here, but from a different perspective. These meetings give a sense that you've got a good group, and you do that. Everybody gets along, and they do that. Everybody likes each other, and and uh, and and they all have good meetings and they do. And I repeat it because I want to drive this home until something controversial comes up. Then you get surprised. Then you, wait a minute, how did this happen? We were all friends here. We, you know, we always have good meetings. What's wrong here? Um, let me, so, so now I want to give you some tips on, on how to, how to implement everything that we've talked about tonight how to make sure to use everything that we have that we've talked about in these pages and how to make sure that it's a part of your organization. Rather than just pleading for everybody to be nice, what we're doing is we are using procedure. In those meetings, when it's just, when it's just easy peasy, there's nothing controversial, everything clips along, you got people out in the parking lot laughing and joking and smoking and, and everybody, everything's good. So in those meetings, practice procedure. And I can't stress this enough. In those easy meetings, practice procedure as an organization. Make sure that nobody speaks out of turn. Make sure that everybody's courteous. Make sure that, that you only speak the allotted amount of time. Oh, there's nothing going on tonight. Go ahead, so-and-so, just do whatever you want. You get relaxed and you don't use procedure during those easy meetings. And then when the tough one comes up, you're not prepared. So I, 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 tell, this, I tell this to everybody, every organization that uses me on a, on a regular basis, or if I get a chance to have at least one session with them to provide training in those easy meetings, no procedure, use procedure, practice procedure, get good at procedure. It's gonna seem like it's, uh, it's gonna seem like it's tedious, it's going to seem like you're being kind of silly sometimes because, you know, I mean, it's all relaxed, but you're trying to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Don't let that fool you. Just go ahead and learn procedure, practice it. That way, when the tough one comes up, you don't have to practice it. When the tough one comes up, when the controversial matter comes up, you know what you're doing because you're used to it and there's no surprises. <clears throat> It's during, it's during those, it's during those easy meetings when you need to hone your skills. It's during those easy meetings when you need to develop the good habits of procedure. Uh, like I said, it's going to seem silly at first. It's going to seem strange. But when the when and I repeat myself and I know it and I and I do this for a reason. Take the easy meetings, get good at procedure so that when the controversial matter shows up, people aren't surprised at the chair or the, or the organization trying to practice proper procedure because they'll be used to it. And when you're implementing proper procedure during those difficult discussions, you will have the best possible time of it and you'll do a good job at it. I've seen this over and over again. So uh, Robert's Rules of Order talks about it. And, and this is something I've experienced. This is something I teach. So. Let me just give you an example. It's something that everybody can relate to. The football team that's going out on the field and they're up against a tough team, uh, they're not just handed the rules of football just before they come out on the field and say, okay, now we really need to know the rules. So here's, here's how you can beat these guys. Everybody look at the rules real quick or, or the coach is going to say, now remember, these are the rules of the game. No, there's a lot of practice and there's a lot of going over the rules and more practice and going over the rules and more practice in going over the rules so that when they come out on the field against that really tough team, 
they had the best possible chance of beating that team. It didn't happen when they came out on the field. It happened for all, it happened during all those times when they were implementing the rules, practicing the rules, learning the rules, learning procedure, learning the good plays. That's where it all took place. So this is the third time I'm saying this. And so pardon me, third time's a charm, right? At the easy meetings, practice the rules, learn the rules, practice the rules, so that when a difficult meeting comes, you're ready for it. And you're not surprised and we'll do a good job at it. Ms. LaRue, that's all I have. I'm done with my notes. I don't know if there are any questions. And, and by the way, let me say this, if, if you're in agreement, if there are questions that have to do with various types of motions or questions that don't necessarily relate to the subject matter, but that's that's entirely up to you, Leah. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll entertain those if that's something that you're agreeable to. Otherwise, we'll just, we'll just uh, do it any way you want. That was me talking to myself, I apologize. Ms. James, Ms. James, go right ahead. Hello, um, Mr. Conway, how can one um, get in contact with you if they have any questions outside of this meeting? Um, what you would do is you would contact, and, have, and pardon Samantha and Leah, I'm not sure exactly who to call, who they should call. Uh, but contact the, the MPU director's office or, the, or that department. And what happens is they, they will look at the question. Sometimes, sometimes Ms. LaRue can answer the question. Um, sometimes she sends it to me and then, and then I'll, uh, I'll take it from there. So, but, but you do want to work through the office. You do want to work through the MPU office. Okay, thank you. Very welcome. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Conway? Oh. Well, this is a quiet group now. Uh, <laughs> so with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and close out. I'm gonna share my screen with you all one more time. Leah, did you have any um, words? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Glover. I do have a question. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. But my question has to do with the agenda. Yes. The agenda drives the meetings. And if it's not on the agenda, should it be brought up in the meeting? We That's vote true. on the agenda at the beginning of the meeting in most MPUs. That depends on your NPU, and, and I would have to look at specific documents to make sure some NPUs don't allow some organ. I'll put it this way: some organizations don't allow new business from the floor. Uh, some organizations require that you work through a committee or that you um, send your your uh, your motion in, excuse me, ahead of time, and then it will be placed on the agenda. Other organizations, they have a category for new business, and uh, that is the common approach. But if, if the organization uh, doesn't want to do it that way and has a different approach as laid out in their governing documents, then that's how it has to happen. So it just depends on their organization's governing documents as to how that would take place. Very welcome. Mrs. Brooks. Thank you. Um, can you, you've mentioned the deliberation debate discussion. Can you walk through, please, uh, from the motion, the second, and then when does the deliberation debate and discussion take place and what does it look and feel like? Okay, um, I'll see what I can do. Uh, so a person, again, we've been using ABC organization with license. Um, a person makes a motion, I move the AGC organization uh, is granted a liquor license or, or um, that, we, uh, that we give a thumbs up or we approve a liquor license, NPU doesn't approve, but that we recommend a liquor license to, to the council and uh, somebody seconds it. Then the chairperson says um, it has been moved and seconded that the ABC organization receives a liquor license. Is there any discussion? And or the chair might say, is there any debate? Actually, Robert's Rules of Order uses the words, 
is during debate. And then somebody raises their hand and, and if I'm chairing the meeting, I would say, uh, yes, ma'am. And she would stand, she would speak her piece. She'd get done, she'd sit down and I'd look around, somebody else raised their hand, I'd say, yes, sir. He'd stand, he'd speak his piece. And during that debate, someone might stand up and say what they wanna say and then say, I make a motion that we amend that to say that it doesn't, their liquor license isn't granted for another 30 days or whatever the amendment would be. Somebody would have to second that. And then now the amendment is what's being debated. And it would be the same process. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And then you'd vote on the amendment and then whether or not the amendment failed or passed would be how the main motion would look after that. And then you'd go back to the main motion, et cetera. Now that's basic. And then I would say, again, I'm chairing the meeting. Is there any further debate? Is there any further discussion? Are you ready for the vote? Nobody says anything. All right, all in favor of ABC organization uh, having a liquor license, say aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. ABC organization, we're going to recommend to the committee um, that ABC organization gets a uh, liquor license. Uh, did that help? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Mr. Martin? Yeah, I, a lot of the discussion up until now has presumed that the speaking to an issue, aka debate, happens after a motion has been made. But in my NPU, I would say north of 90% of the discussion happens before a motion has been made. We have an issue that is on our agenda because it's been placed on our agenda, say a rezoning or a liquor license or whatever it is. And, you know, 10 or 20 people will, will speak and say, you know, I dislike this, or I like this, or here's my opinion on this, but no one will actually make a motion to approve or to deny this rezoning or liquor license or whatever it is. And um, so I'm sort of curious as to how one goes about framing that period of discussion before a motion has been made. Um, one question, Mr. Martin, how does it end up on the agenda? The city places it on the agenda because we are required to make a recommendation on this issue. Okay, so so the city has placed it on your agenda as a as a an item to discuss. Does the committee see it before it gets on your agenda? We well, and I mean it depends on the MPU. My MPU does not have a committee structure, so no. Okay. Technically speaking, um, a. Discussion cannot take place without a motion on the floor. So, so we should begin our debate with, would someone like to make a motion to do something about this? Not yeah, see, that's, that's kind of a, just that's, recognizing people who've raised their hands and saying, what would you like to say? That's kind of a precarious arrangement. I, I would have to uh, look a little bit more closely at the process because when you don't have a motion on the floor, you're just talking in, in the, into the air. I mean, you've got a subject before you. In effect, what you've done is you've gone into committee of the whole without going into committee of the whole. And well, now, I, I think that that's what most MPUs have to deal with is that we get an agenda from the planning department that has topics, but not motions. So we- but not recommendations, right? right. And it doesn't go through committee. See, I've been under the impression, I don't know all the NPUs. I've been to three meetings when I first got started helping with NPUs. It's not an excuse, I'm just explaining why I'm not very, I'm not familiar with every NPU and how it works. So I've been under the impression that in most cases before a question like that comes up, it's gone to committee, committee's gonna make a recommendation one way or another. That's been my understanding. And so in your case, I, I, I Mr. Martin, I guess I would just have to say, before I could answer it with any kind of uh, um, certainty and, and help, I would really, I would really want to see the governing documents and and make a more informed, uh, give a more informed opinion because that that's a tough spot. That's to tell you, you've just got a subject to deal with, and you're you're virtually functioning like a committee is what you're doing, and because in committee work that's okay. In committee work, it's all right to just to start talking about, or in a small board, uh, to just start talking about something and then say, Did everybody agree? Yeah, all, all in favor, say aye, go. Um, that's acceptable. But in, a, in a, an actual 
uh, formal assembly. Um, something needs to be adjusted in my view. But again, I, I wouldn't know how to, how to address that unless I saw the governing documents. So I, I know it wasn't much help and I, I apologize. I mean, I can, I can send you a copy of our agenda. I don't know that it's all that different from anyone else's. I mean, it has topics, but not recommendations. Well, let me, let me uh, work through Leah a little bit and, and cause I'm more, I'm intrigued by this, by this uh, approach. And uh, and I really want to I really want to get a better look at it. And if your MPU isn't the only MPU that's operating that way, um, I, I would like to, to work a little bit with Leah and, and anybody else that would be able to 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 help me through those details, and then see what we can do from there. And uh, I'll do my best, either directly or indirectly, to try to speak to it and and maybe get that those ideas back to you. Let, if I can um, jump in, and I mentioned this at the start of the meeting, but I'll reiterate, I apologize. I'm actually in an MPU meeting on another device, oh, so I apologize that my attention is divided. Okay. Um, I think I'm understanding that this question is around the, the motion being made at the start of the discussion versus the discussion happening first and then the motion being made. But even with your MPU meeting agendas as they are, you could still begin the discussion with a motion. Um, I, for some reason, I can't remember how my MPU handles it, but I know my neighborhood association starts out with the motion and then we move into the discussion. So, it, it, you know, when you get to item number Z-22-013 is an application to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, the motion out of the zoning committee is to recommend approval. Motion out of the committee doesn't so need a second. So then you ask if there's any discussion on the motion and that begins the discussion on the motion. So is, are we saying something different here? The way Mr. Martin is describing it to me and Mr. Martin, I'm confident you're still listening. So help me if I miss this. The way Mr. Martin is describing the scenario is that a subject is on the, on the agenda. It's not, and, and what the, and, and in his words, the city has given this subject to the MPU to make a decision. And there's no committee that's looked at it. It's just a subject that's been on the agenda coming from the city. And so let's say it's ABC liquor license. So, so the city says, we want you to decide on whether or not ABC organization should have a liquor license. And that's on the agenda. And so the, the, the challenge here is, is that right there has to be a motion in a second before there's a decision but if somebody says i move that we grant the liquor license and then there's a second there's an impression that there are people in the room that initially want to to uh, grant the liquor license or if somebody says i make a motion that we don't then you have to come from that starting point and so the starting point kind of sets the tone and well that's the challenge with that scenario. No, no, it's more complicated than that because what someone will say is, I don't like this liquor license because of these reasons, but not make a motion. No, no, I understand that. And so, so, so we will have a lot of people speaking to a topic and no motion. With no motion. And that's, that's actually not in order. That's improper. What I was describing, yeah, right. What I was describing to, uh, to Ms. LaRue was, is if we, <sighs> the motion right out of the gate with just a subject well now you're starting with i approve or you're starting with i disapprove and the motion is setting the tone already and it may not really be how everybody feels but something's got to get it started that's a that's that's a that's a, a precarious arrangement and so I, I i think it merits further discussion because i think that needs to be um i think that needs to be looked at more closely and maybe some suggestions at least on how to on how to um, um, tweak that a little bit. Yeah, so I, 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 we should have a conversation about this, Dennis, because it's it's an interesting point. Um, I do want to say though that particularly for those MPUs that have complained about really really lengthy meetings, but really for everyone citywide, I am constantly urging, encouraging, sometimes begging people to look at the agenda before the meeting. The, unfortunately, the vast majority of MPU members see the agenda for the first time at the meeting. 
We publish the agendas so that, for those that don't know, our department publishes every single MPU meeting agenda one week prior to the meeting, at least. If there's a holiday, it may be a week and a day prior, but generally it's one week prior to the meeting. We publish the agenda on our website. That link doesn't change. The website location, but you can always, always, always rely on our website, the city's website, to find your meeting agenda very, very easily organized at that. I encourage people to look at that agenda because it's got a significant amount of the information that you're looking for and that I often hear people in the meetings asking. Tons of the questions that I hear in the meetings are answered by looking at the applications that are attached to the agendas. Sure. It is beneficial to have committees for sure, but I also recognize that, you know, MPUs are staffed by volunteers, period. Sure. They're, they're staffed by volunteers and every, every MPU is not gonna have um, well-functioning committees or committees at all. So if you don't have a committee, it's all the more important to review the applications before the meeting because otherwise, you have a situation where you've got a meeting with 80 people in it and 60 of them are raising their hands to ask questions about this presentation or about this application. And I mean, I have no dog in the fight because I'm not, you know, I'm not a member of your, your MPUs. I don't have a dog in the fight. Um, you can certainly manage that however you wish, but we get the complaints for sure when the meetings run until 11 or midnight. Well, Leah, there's still some things that I would pose and question and go and and, uh, and and ask you about a process. And so maybe it would be good for you and I to speak uh, outside the meeting to try to detail some of the, and answer some of the questions I have about the process that's common. Um, so, and I hear you, I, being prepared, looking at the agenda, it's, it's out early, be informed. I mean, all, all that's very important. So, so thank you. And, uh, but yeah, maybe if we could just talk a little bit outside the meeting. I think there are other questions. Amy Stout, go ahead. You can lower, um, unmute yourself. Yes, hi. I was just going to echo what uh, Jim said. Our, we have the same situation. We don't have committees. We don't have recommendations that come with it. And you also have the applicant who wants to make his case. So especially yeah. I would think in a situation where nobody's looked at the agenda, they present their case and then people can ask questions but we do have a board structure and um so we kind of i guess what you would call operate as a committee of the whole but it's only a nine member board that votes but it's not i don't it's not my impression that it's necessarily unusual to not have motions that come with you know preformed that we have and I know our neighborhood does the same thing. We may not have committee recommendations for every item on the agenda. So, yeah, people just start asking questions and then a, a, a motion might arise. That's my experience. Yeah, and, and so um, it's something to look at. It's something to look at. It's not, it's not detrimental because so far, um, you know, you're making decisions and there are votes and so on. But as far as cleaning up and and being more efficient um, with with deliberations uh, I think I think this needs a closer look are there other questions I think Eartha James has a question yes um Mrs James you can unmute yourself thank you um this is no disrespect at all to Miss Terry or anybody, um, um, cause I was asking, I'm asking because we're here right now and I'll have to go back and forth with emails. Um, and I had given some people your name, Mr. Conway, uh, because the other uh, parliamentary procedures training was, this one is great too, but um, I forget what it was called, but anyway, um, and um, as you can see, we only have less than 50 people on this call. And I, at our MPU meeting, there are uh, quite a few more people. And I was um, wondering about a particular workshop or special call meeting for our particular MPU 
And if there's a fee assessed to have that, how much that is, um, because uh, some people, uh, we expressed some concerns about learning more, but uh, for whatever different reason, people are not able to make the training, but they still want to be informed. And um, so um, we just thought it might be, a, wondered if it was possible to have you to do a special call meeting with our MPU, Mr. Conway, or a workshop specifically for our MPU so that um, more of us can be informed. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer this way. I do train. Um, I have a number of clients and I have organizations that contact me. Uh, I'm going to Augusta uh, next week uh, for an organization. I, I'm pretty involved that way. And so if, if, uh, if through this department, that wouldn't be possible then you can contact me directly and I can work it out with your NPU if it's okay with, with the leadership of the NPU. Um, and I, I'm sure it would be. I wouldn't, wouldn't think that, of course, I don't know, but it'd be good to keep them informed anyway, just to make sure of, of ins and outs that may come up. But um, from a, from a um, parliamentarian standpoint, I'd be more than happy to have a discussion with you about coming out and providing training with your NPU. If, if it couldn't happen through uh, through the Department of City Planning. Okay, and is there a fee assessed? And if so, how much is that? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask y'all to take these questions offline. This is not um, appropriate for this setting at all. And I would also just add in there, because I wouldn't be me if I didn't, I don't see um, MPU members attending a special called meeting, but not attending the class that teaches that. Like that's, if, if you can't get them to join you here at the class, at any of the four classes that we offer, you're probably not going to get those same people to attend a special call meeting. Um, but yeah, I'll, we can exchange information offline. This isn't the forum for that. Thank you, but I, I no longer have your information, Ms. LaRue. What? That's so I have, insulting. I, no, I, well, tell it to the phone company because I got a new phone and, you know, sometimes things don't transfer over. I'll, I'll email you, Ms. James. Okay, thank you. And by the way, my contact info is on every um, MPU agenda as well, by the way. Okay, okay, thank you. But I, I'll reach out. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Oh, okay. So I think Ms. Carla is trying to ask a question. This is somewhat related. It's about the book. Is it an ebook or is it an actual hard copy that has the Robert? It's, it's a physical or, book. Okay. Thank you. Can we provide a session on committees? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so also, um, for those who are on here, if you rushed through, and I'm sure none of you did that, but if you rushed through the um, registration form and skipped through the uh, questions regarding your address or just kind of threw something in there, we use the addresses to send out the actual books. So if you're not sure if you put your address in, if you would like to email me your actual address so that you can receive your book, that's fine. Um, you can actually just reply back to the email I'm about to send out in regards to the evaluation for this course. And seeing there are no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close out. I wanna thank uh, Mr. Conway, of course, for uh, this course in our parliamentary procedures series. We have two more courses coming up with him this year. So I hope that you all can make those classes. Thank you again, Mr. Conway. Um, our upcoming courses for the remainder of this month as we, kick, we are kicking off June and this summer, we have in our, under our civic participation area, CP 1001, the legislative process. That class is next Thursday at 6 p.m. online. And then we have two weeks after that, Thursday, June 23rd um, at 6 p.m. under um, our community development 
see uh, in under our housing series, I'm sorry, CD 1003.003, Tenants' Rights and Responsibilities. And our last course for this month is our CP 1003 Civic Participation for Seniors Forum, which will be Tuesday, June 28th at 10 a.m. And if you would like to register or for more information, we ask that you visit mpuatlanta.org and also to follow us on social media. Oh, I'm sorry, that is the wrong direction. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at MPU Atlanta, and also on next door, City of Atlanta Neighborhood Planning Units. Also, if you follow us on Instagram, you would have saw that we were at Gordon White Park today for our converse, um, our conversation, uh, corner conversation series. It's a nice video if you guys want to go in there. And we'll have another one next month. So be on the lookout for that date. But if we don't have any more questions, I bid you all a good night. Thank you. Good night and thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome.